Good afternoon. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome. We are resuming the works of the Libre Committee with a hearing on the situation of fundamental rights in the European Union as announced this morning when we concluded the ordinary session of the Libe Committee. We are welcoming first the members, the guest speakers and participants in this hearing in which we welcome most warmly. First of all, as Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Mr. Torbjorn Jagland. It is an honor to have him here at the podium, but also welcoming you on this hearing, announcing that interpretation will be provided in all of the official languages of the European Union, exception of, I'm so sorry, it's the usual stuff when the, 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 the number of cabins are limited, Estonian, Finnish, Maltese, and Croatian. I'm sorry about that. The rest of the languages will be provided for as interpreting system. We're also aware that this session is going to be web streamed. All of the interventions of the participants and speakers will be thus recorded, bearing in mind. You know that due to our conference of presidents open to all members, we're getting started now at 3.30 instead of 3 as usual, and we should be ending by 1900, 7 p.m. Bear it in mind when it comes to the timing of the discussion and all of the interventions. So we're asking in advance all the speakers to respect a reasonable framework for the speaking time. We will be strengthening on the European mechanisms to ensure democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights, respected all across the European Union, intended to feed reflections in the framework of the report on the situation of the fundamental rights in Europe. We're wishing you, of course, a very fruitful debate. First, before we hear from our Secretary General, Mr. Jagland, representing the Council of Europe, we're going to hear also Monsieur Louis Michel, which is rapporteur on the issue of fundamental rights, and we'll be co-chairing this hearing. Monsieur Louis Michel, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Thank you, Chair, Secretary General. The objective of today's hearing is to guarantee that Member States of the EU respect the commitments that they have made in the area of fundamental rights, rule of law, democracy, and equality, as is uh, anchored in Article 2 of the Treaty, which states that the European Union is based on the respect of human dignity, of freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, as well as respect for human rights, including minority rights. These European values need to be respected and promoted by the EU and its member states. Unfortunately, all member states have seen violations of these rights, and they vary in their significance, but they often are an institutional or constitutional crisis. We could see that there are violations of these European values. The European Parliament has been a key in this area of fundamental rights. My draft report supports the need to reinforce this policy either based on the current treaty or by foreseeing modifications to the treaty if deemed necessary. The hearing today is organized to, to tackle this topic. So I'd like to thank all the different speakers as well. They're representing uh, different uh, organizations and actors on the ground, and I'm grateful that their availability, uh, are they available rather, and that they're here to discuss that with us today. I am open to any questions that will allow us to enrich the reports that uh, is being prepared at present. So I'd like to uh, 
say how honoured I am to uh, welcome the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Mr. Jacques Lund, who I'll give the floor to now. I think that you have 10 to 15 minutes uh, speaking time, which I think will be enough for that, so we can stick to our timetable. And afterwards, uh, perhaps we'll then have one or two questions from the audience. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Rapporteur. First of all, I would like to say that I indeed appreciate that uh, uh, you have invited me here, and also the fact that you, Louis Michel, came to my office in order to have, have a dialogue on this very important uh, issue. First of all, I would like to say a few words about uh, the, the Council of Europe, which uh, has 47 member states. The only country which is not a member yet is uh, Belarus, and 28 of the uh, members of the European Union is, are, of course, a member in our organization. And uh, all of them uh, have signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights. And it's important to understand that this convention is not only a convention, it is a convention system. The European Court of Human Rights is at the top of this system uh, and oversees the implementation of the Convention in the Member States. And all the individuals in the, four, uh, in the 47 member countries can bring complaints uh, of um, human rights violations to this Court once they have exhausted all possibilities of appeal in the Member States. The European Court of Human Rights is complemented by other institutions, such as the Human Rights Commissioner, who is present here today, or the Venice Commission, or the expert body on constitutional matters, which offers legal advice to countries throughout the world. The Council of Europe promotes human rights through legally binding conventions and monitors member states' implementation of these standards, through specific independent specialized monitoring bodies such as the European Committee of Social Rights, the CPT or Anti-Torture Committee, the Greco Group of States Against Corruption, and the Greta Group of Experts on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. There are others as well, but I just mentioned these as um, examples. Cases on non-compliance are determined by these monitoring bodies and solutions on how to remedy them are proposed to member states. To strengthen the existing system, the 47 ministers of foreign affairs last May at the ministerial meeting that we have every year invited me to present on a regular basis an overview, overview of human rights democracy and the rule of law in Europe based on the findings of all these monitoring mechanisms. And I will set up an overview for each member country based on this uh, information coming from the monitoring bodies. Um, and I will also, based on this, all this information, as I said, give a um, or make public a report, annual report on the state of human rights and the rule of law on the whole continent. Um, so this report will reflect the standards set by our organization and be based on, um, and it is important to understand that this report will be based on the convention-based or um, con uh, or monitoring bodies based on resolutions from the organization. So these are legally binding uh, standards uh, that the monitoring bodies are overseeing. And it's important to understand that the Council of Europe is very much expert-oriented based on uh, information coming from the experts in these monitoring bodies. Therefore, it is, uh, these findings are very much respected because they are not politicized. 
and the Council of Europe does not have any geopolitical or geostrategic interest. We do not have any interest, economic interest. We have only one interest, namely to see to it that the member states uh, comply with their obligations, the binding legal obligations under the European Com Commission, uh, Convention. So, to sum up, and this is very important, the Council of Europe provides benchmarks, indicators, and concrete assistance to all 47 me uh, member states um, and the 47 ministers of foreign affairs have decided to strengthen this system both with regard to monitoring and also with regard to how we assist our member countries in order to comply or to remedy the shortcomings that um, uh, the monitoring bodies uh, um, show. Now, uh, coming to the theme that you are now discussing, I would like to say first that I support very much the efforts of EU institutions aimed at strengthening the EU capacity to contribute to the protection of human rights and the rule of law within and also outside its member states. Therefore, my prior, uh, important priority when I came to Strasbourg as Secretary was to improve relations with the European Union. I looked upon the European Union as an important partner. And I think that now the European Union look upon Council of Europe as an important uh, partner. Um, and we are cooperating now on all uh, levels, I would say. We indeed have the joint responsibility of strengthening the existing human rights protection system in Europe and ensuring coherence. It is important uh, that these facts are taking, taken into consideration when making a proposal to create a new EU mechanism. Let me also underline that developing parallel systems could inevitably risk weakening the existing mechanisms and creating a new dividing lines in Europe, it could lead to confusion and to forum shopping. It would risk undermining the very foundation of the effectiveness and the legitimacy of the human rights protection system, namely one set out uh, of rules for all. So how can we avoid that kind of duplication that kind of forum shopping in our member states, and how can we avoid further confusion? Uh, so, I believe that the, EU, the future EU initiative should take into account, base itself upon and cooperate with the Council. This is my first point. We have a responsibility to ensure coherence. Therefore, it is important to aim for greater involvement of EU in the Council of Europe monitoring bodies and work, as already recommended by the European Parliament in 2010. The European Parliament indeed has already indicated that the overall human rights protection system of the Council of Europe needs to be strengthened and that accession to the European Convention on Human Rights of the European Union constitutes an essential first step, which should be comple completed um, uh, inter alia uh, uh, also with uh, accession to the revised social charter. It also called for EU accession to Council of Europe bodies such as the CPT, anti uh, which I've referred to already, Anti-Torture Committee, the ECRI, Anti-Racism Commission, and the CPERS, uh, Judicial System Evaluation Mechanisms, which uh, the European Commission, by the way, has already uh, got use of. So these are important instruments that uh, the European Union can uh, use and also accede uh, to. And I know that there is also a discussion now in addition to the um, overall aim of getting EU accession to the European Con Convention on Human Rights, there also, is also a discussion on uh, accession to some of these, um, some of our conventions and all the conventions, and also to 
uh, for instance, uh, the Greco, which I mentioned, which is about uh, f fighting uh, um, corruption. Finally, I would also like to add a few words in relation with the recent uh, revelations made by Edward Snowden concerning mass surveillance, because I, we have to also in, uh, to look into this when we are discussing how to protect human rights on the whole continent. This issue might raise important human rights uh, questions in other member states, especially related to the right to privacy as guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights and the Council of Europe Data Protection Convention. The principles set by the European Court of Human Rights are very clear. The Court recognizes that democratic societies find themselves threatened by highly sophisticated forms of espionage and by terrorism, with the result that the state must be able, in order to counter such threats, to undertake the secret surveillance of subversive elements operating within its jurisdiction. However, the state cannot do whatever they want to defend the national security. They must, and this is defined in the European Com uh, Convention itself, and by the case law of the court in Strasbourg. They must operate within strict parameters. As a minimum, three safeguards should be provided. First, secret surveillance systems must be set out in a law that must be precise and clear as to the offenses. Activities and people subjected to surveillance must set out strict limits on its duration, as well as rules on disclosure and destruction of surveillance data. Second, procedures should be put in place to ensure the proper examination, use and storage of the data obtained and those subjected to surveillance should be given a chance to exercise the right to an effective remedy. And third, the bodies supervising the use of surveillance should be independent and appointed by an accountable uh, and being accountable to Parliament rather than to the executive. These are the basic principles that already are inherent in the Convention and defined by the case law of the Court of Human Rights. I mentioned this and, and the, the Convention that we already have, namely the Data Protection Convention, uh, is already there. It is open for uh, accession from states outside the European continent. We are now in a process of revising this. We started this long before uh, Snowden revealed his information because we saw that the technological development uh, necessitated this. And um, uh, this is a convention that covers the entire continent. I, of course, um, appreciate very much that there may be bilateral agreements between the United States and, and some European countries and that the U European Union is also uh, working on its own um, directive in this. But we are now in a process of close coordination between what is going on in the European Union and what is going on in the Council of Europe, because all of us um, uh, agree that uh, we need also a pan-European system that covers the rights of every individual, not only those who are covered by bilateral uh, agreements or those who are covered by a directive or law from uh, 28 member states. So it, it is a clear evidence on the perspective that we need to have. Nothing must be done to weaken the pan-European system, which is covering not only 28 member uh, countries, but are covering countries like Russia, Turkey, and uh, 18 other countries outside the European Union and, of course, are covering all the citizens on, the pan on this continent. And it is important also to understand, which I have said, that to recognize that also the European Union needs to have its own uh, mechanisms, but there should be no duplication. We need to work together and coordinate over efforts for the entire continent. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Mr. Jagland, for this most...
qualified insight on the uh, necessary cooperation between all the spheres of the European integration related to fundamental rights, Council of Europe and the European Union. We thank you for that. And with no further delay, I suggest we proceed to the first panel as it is foreseen in the uh, order of the day. We will be thus starting by session one in order to elaborate on the respect, protection, and promotion of fundamental rights, state of the play, and potential solutions by reminding once again the importance of the timing. I suggest we first hear Mr. Paul Nimitz, who is the Director for Fundamental Rights and Citizenship in DG Justice at the European Commission. We're inviting Mr. Nimitz to take a seat in the podium so that we can hear from him. Yes, please. Thank you. You're most welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you want to take your seat. We will be hearing for the next for the next 10 minutes from Mr. Nimitz, and then we will be passing the floor to Mr. Milasiute, who is uh, representing here the Group de Travail de Conseil des Droits Fondamentaux, uh, Working Group on Fundamental Rights, Citizens' Rights and Free Circulation of People, and then uh, Mr. Morton Jerome, who is the Director of the Agency of Fundamental Rights. But first, let's hear, we welcome him. Mr. Nemitz, representing DG Fundamental Rights, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a great pleasure to have the possibility to uh, discuss today uh, with such a distinguished uh, panel and audience. Let me first say that, of course, Europe and its member states have a very long uh, tradition of protecting fundamental rights uh, on different levels. Of course, in our member states, there's a long tradition um, of national catalogues of fundamental rights. Um, we have in the European Union a tradition of fundamental rights which predates um, the Charter, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, and this tradition is based on a long-standing jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. And, of course, uh, in Europe, we also have uh, the important level of protection of fundamental rights based on the European Convention of Human Rights. As far as the implementation of the Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights of the European Union is concerned, I can report to you that since 2010, all Commission proposals and legislative acts are systematically vetted as regarding uh, their compliance with the Charter rights. Uh, this work is based on the Charter strategy, which entails systematically applying the Charter in practice when preparing and adopting EU law. And uh, this strategy of uh, the Commission has also uh, triggered momentum in the European Parliament and in the Council. Also, these two institutions have committed to systematically assessing impacts on fundamental rights of their amendments to the proposals uh, uh, of the Commission when adopting new legislations. Citizens in Europe are now more informed about fundamental rights and on where to turn to obtain redress and this is the most important question when it comes to the protection of fundamental rights. The new fundamental rights pages of the European e-justice portal provide information and are a small contribution uh, to making uh, matters more transparent. A significant development has been the increased judicial application of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Court of Justice of the European Union has referred to the Charter in more than 100 judgments already, and I would say, even more importantly, national courts are increasingly uh, referring uh, to the European Charter uh, of uh, Fundamental Rights when um, rendering justice in the national context. This is an encouraging development as community of law, which we are, relies on national courts. It is the national judge who, in exercising his or her powers, delivers the rights granted in union law to citizens. The increasing reference to the Charter gives the first indication of an effective decentralized application of the Charter within the national constitutional orders. This is an important step on the road to a more coherent system which guarantees equal levels of fundamental rights and protection in all member states whenever EU law is implemented. It is clear that the people of Europe have a high interest and expect, have high expectations about enforcement of fundamental rights by the EU. 
The Commission receives every year around 5,000 letters from the general public regarding fundamental rights, freedom of movement, equal, uh, equality, protection of personal data, and all uh, the um, uh, provisions relating to the Charter. Approximately three-quarters of these letters concern cases outside the remit of EU law. And um, as you know, currently, member states only have to respect the Charter as such when their measures are measures of application of uh, EU law. Let me at this occasion also point out uh, one of the differences between the system of protection of fundamental rights the Council of Europe provides and, on the other hand, uh, the system of protection of fundamental rights the European law uh, uh, provides, which is, of course, the right of the Commission to take ex officio action um, as far as uh, non-compliance of member states with EU law uh, is concerned. So where member states within the remit of EU law do not respect fundamental rights, the European Commission can take action ex officio, and this action can lead to judgments of the Court of Justice and the imposition of sanctions on member states, which is, of course, a different degree of effectiveness uh, than uh, some other systems uh, provide. The effectiveness of fundamental rights uh, protection is vital, not only for the people living in the EU, but also for the development of the EU itself. Respect for fundamental rights within the EU will help to build mutual trust between member states and, more generally, public confidence in EU policies. The accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights is an obligation resulting from Article 6 of the Treaty of the European Union, and it will enable individuals to seize the European Court of Human Rights against acts of the EU, which is currently not possible, but let me say that the European Union is the only international body which measures its own acts against its own catalogue of fundamental rights, and this is happening already today. The accession process, of course, will take years because it is not only up to the European Union, but also to all other members of the Council of Europe uh, um, to agree to this accession. It will also make the Union part of the Council of Europe system that supervises compliance with the European Convention of Human Rights across 47 countries in Europe. The Commission has always considered the EU's accession to the European Convention of Human Rights as a priority. Significant progress has been achieved. It is now important to maintain the momentum in order to bring, as soon as possible, the process of accession to its conclusion. Developing the European area of justice requires that all EU institutions commit to a common approach to guarantee the respect of fundamental rights throughout the legislative process. There is still progress to be made to ensure that the impact on fundamental rights is fully considered during negotiations where final compromises on legislation are elaborated in the institutions. In this respect, a renewed inter-institutional commitment could be envisaged in order to ensure consistent application of the Fundamental Rights Charter. Contributions of stakeholders, and I would like to uh, mention here in particular the National Human Rights Institutes, who have just recently opened a joint office in Brussels, could be useful uh, feeding the annual report of the European Commission on the implementation of the Charter. Through these annual reports, which respond to a request of the European Parliament, um, the Commission meets the legitimate expectation of placing fundamental rights at the heart of EU policies and the legitimate expectation on transparency. Once rules are adopted by the EU legislator, it needs to be ensured as a matter of priority that Member States will not only honour their obligation to speedily implement and apply these rules, but also that citizens are equipped with effective means to obtain redress when these rules are breached or applied in non-compliance with the Charter. At national level, courts are applying a, uh, playing a primary role. In addition, the effectiveness of specialized institutions such as the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also uh, the National Human Rights Institutions, Equality Bodies, Ombudsman, Data Protection Authorities is important to help citizens to better enforce and better receive their fundamental rights to the extent um, um, that they have a right to these rights. The challenges um, ahead for safeguarding the rule of law in the European Union have already been addressed.
Um, let me uh, say a few words on this uh, subject, which is core of uh, the rapporteur Louis Michel's uh, report. The EU is, of course, grounded on certain basic values. We cannot take them for granted. We need to be sure that we have the tools to show our citizens that we can respond when these values are endangered. President Barroso raised this again in this year's State of the Union speech at a moment of challenge to the rule of law in our own member states. He addressed the need to make a bridge between political persuasion and targeted infringement procedures on the one hand and the option of Article 7 of the treaty, namely the suspension of a member state's rights on the other hand. And uh, he announced that the Commission will present these options in the form of a communication. Ex if you may come to conclusions, please, Ex mind the timing. Experience has confirmed the usefulness of the Commission's role as an independent and objective referee in these matters. We are working on the rule of law mechanism and will present this communication in due course. On 21st and 22nd November, we will hold the Assise de Justice, and we have made public discussion papers on fundamental rights and the rule of law, and we invite all of you and the general public to participate in the great debate on the future of the rule of law and the future of fundamental rights in Europe. The Commission certainly has demonstrated its readiness to live up to this challenge. It has engaged and it will continue to engage as this is what people can expect from the Commission in light of the promises of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to Mrs. Vigante Malasciute, Chair of the Council Working Party on Fundamental Rights, Citizens' Rights and Free Movement of Persons. Could I insist that each speaker respects the speaking time? Because we are limited in time and human rights means leaving time for everybody else to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am honored to be here and I am honored to be chairing FREMP during the Lithuanian presidency. So not surprisingly, I am going to talk about the work of FREMP. What I am not going to try to do, I am not going to try to exhaust the fundamental rights related work of the Council because literally every working group of the Council does something which is somehow related to the fundamental rights. Well, to give just a few examples. If we talk about social questions, then of course the social questions working party deals with important questions of equality, horizontal directive. If we talk, talk about specific uh, issues related to the protection of privacy, then DAPEX and the data protection issues spring to mind. So FRIMP is not the only council working party involved in fundamental rights protection, but it is an important working party in, um, for many reasons. FREMP is the working party which addresses issues related to the development of structures important for the, fundamental, for the protection of fundamental rights. And uh, FREMP is involved in identification of further steps necessary for the effectiveness of the system of the protection of fundamental rights in the EU. So most often FREMP is not directly involved in uh, standard setting work, but uh, its work is related to better realization of fundamental rights. Now, if we talk about methods of work of FREMP and, uh, and also the themes or the questions that FREMP addresses in its work, um, it would probably be fair to say that FREMP combines two approaches. That is, uh, the approach of working on specific files, that would be a thematic approach, and also having broader discussions uh, on fundamental rights. That would be general approach. But that would be too simple. Often specific files have um, implications for, for broader discussions on fundamental rights. They have implications of rather general nature. To give just a few examples, um, the work of REM, which is related to the Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, the EU's accession to the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, or FREMS work related to the examination of charter application. Um, a few words on these three files, or FREMS work on these three files. Uh, first of all, FRA, Fundamental Rights Agency related work. Um, FREMP is involved 
in a way, in shaping the work of fundamental rights agency. Uh, of course, fully respecting the independence of the agency, but still, uh, FREM has a certain role to play. <laughs> Well, if we look at the history, then it was a predecessor of FREMP, the ad hoc working group on uh, fundamental rights, which, was, um, which had a task of working on the establishing regulation of the agency. And after that, FREMP inherited those FRA-related files. So um, FREMP uh, is involved in um, the work on developing of the multi-annual framework, so the, the multi-annual working fro program of the agency. And currently, FRAMP is involved in thinking about the future of the agency. That is, we are working on the um, recommendations following the external evaluation after the agency. So it's one aspect. FRAMP is, FRAMP is involved in shaping the work of FRA, but also, um, FREMP deals with or tries to promote using the data collected by FRA, using the advice available from the FRA. So this FRA-related work in general is aimed at improving the quality of fundamental rights-related work, both at EU level and member states level. So if it's often, even though it's often the work of, on specific files, it has very general and broad implications. The second specific file, but again with rather general implications, that's the EU's accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. It was already mentioned in, in the speech by Mr. Paul Nemitz. Well, of course, the EU's accession is important because um, it will enhance the coherence of the protection of human rights in Europe, EU and broader Europe. And, uh, it will promote human rights in Europe. It will signify, and it already signifies, I believe, a strong commitment from the Union to fundamental rights on a broader scale, because the EU is, submits itself to an external mechanism of control of its human rights-related work. Um, the third file, examination of charter application. Again, this is something that was already mentioned. Every year the Commission comes up with a report on the charter application. Every year FREMP examines this report and um, adopts or prepares for adoption a set of council conclusions. And uh, as a recent example, the most recent example of such conclusions show, um, this is a good occasion, occasion to have a broader discussion on fundamental rights issues and the rule of law issues. Under the Irish presidency, the June conclusions adopted on the application of the Charter also addressed such issues as the need to shape, a possible need to shape a collaborative and systematic method to tackle the issue of respecting the rule of law as a prerequisite for the protection of fundamental rights. In those conclusions, uh, the Council identified certain substantive elements to be considered in this process of shaping a systematic method to tackle the issue of respecting the rule of law. I'll mention just two of those substantive elements. One was that the process of thinking, of discussing the need, the shaping of such a new systematic method should be inclusive all member states, EU institutions, and all relevant stakeholders, including the civil society, should be involved. And secondly, I'll <laughs> note one element. Specifically, the conclusions made a link between promoting the rule of law and the importance of fighting hate crime and discrimination. So this would be already an example of a broader discussion on the fundamental rights and rule of law and the rule of law that took place and can take place in FRAMP. Another example of broader discussions on fundamental rights and human rights in which FRAMP is traditionally involved is the issue of internal and external coherence of EU human rights or fundamental rights policy. And here I would like to note that cooperation between the two relevant council working groups uh, FREMP for fundamental rights and COHOM for human rights as an element uh, of foreign policy. This cooperation has been developed and it is being developed currently. So now I'll come to the second part of my presentation and that is what FREMP does under the Lithuanian presidency. Um, well, the main, the, the main issue to say is 
we understand that the continuity of the work of the Council is important, and we try to ensure that the agenda of FREMP under the Lithuanian Presidency reflects those broader needs of the Council in general uh, in the field of the protection of fundamental rights. So I'll just give you a list of um, issues that are on the agenda of FREMP under the Lithuanian Presidency. First of all, it's the external evaluation or the future of the Fundamental Rights Agency. Here we are preparing the Council conclusions and it is our input into the thinking process. Of course, it's going to be the Commission which is going to either submit a proposal on the changes, amendments of establishing regulation or it may choose not to, that we just provide <laughs> our ideas on the need of any such amendments. The second issue is the EU citizenship report. And here again, we are providing, we are working on the Council conclusions and this is the input of the Council into the European Year of Citizens. The third file, and that is thematically linked to the broader, linked to the broader discussion on the fundamental rights and the rule of law, that is the question of the effectiveness of existing EU instruments for fighting hate crime. And here I would like to note our excellent cooperation um, with the Fundamental Rights Agency. And uh, the Irish presidency, FREMP, requested an opinion from the, the Fundamental Rights Agency on the effectiveness sufficiency of the framework decision on fight the racism and xenophobia and on the victims' needs. And now under the Lithuanian presidency, we received the agency's opinion. Uh, we are going to, we are, together with, um, with the agency, we are organizing a fundamental rights conference, annual conference in Vilnius, and after that we are going to use the findings of FRA for the draft council conclusions. So we are planning a discussion in the council on the effectiveness of fighting hate crime. Then, of course, we work to the extent possible on the EU accession to the ECHR, informal discussions on certain elements of internal rules take place in FREMP, and the Council is looking forward to the proposal by the Commission on internal rules, a full consolidated version of that. Two other things to note, and I'll be brief. We are planning a discussion on the 21st of November in FREMP on the coherence of internal and external dimensions of EU human rights policy. We are inviting representatives of the Council of Europe, EU Special Representative for Human Rights, the Director of the Fundamental Rights Agency and the Chair of COHOM for a discussion on many things, among them on whether we need a strategy for the, on fundamental rights similar to the one that the EU has on the protection of human rights in its foreign policy. And the last item I would like to note, which is on the agenda of FREMP under the Lithuanian Presidency. This is something that we have discussed only once, but I think it is important. And this is the cooperation between the Commission and the Council of Europe Commission on the Effectiveness of uh, Effective Justice, CEPESH, for the purpose of data collection for the preparation of the Justice Scoreboard. Um, FREMP started actually the dialogue between the Council and the Commission on the preparation of the 2014 Justice Scoreboard in the context of European semester, that is growth agenda, economic growth agenda. And uh, we, the Council, were reassured by the Commission that both a political discussion at the Council and a technical discussion on the preparation of the 2014 Justice Scoreboard will follow, would follow. Uh, member states expressed a clear wish to be involved in such process if it takes place. To conclude, a lot of things are going on in the, in the field of a protection of fundamental rights and a culture of respect of the rule of law. Thematic approach contributes to a broader debate and becomes part of it, so I would say that the choice of method, thematic or general, is not decisive. Both methods can be used, both can lead to progress in the field of the protection of fundamental rights. I, I would like to stress that continuity of the work is probably more important than, than the choice between those two methods, general and, and thematic. I thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, <coughs> Madame. Uh... Thank you very much, Madame.
I'll now give the floor to Mr. Morton Sherham, Director of the European Agency for Fundamental Rights. I have to remind you, I'm sorry, that uh, we must ask our speakers to stick to time. I'll have to cut you off if you don't stick to time. We're ten minutes late already. We wanted time for people to ask questions from the floor. It's all very well. Uh, just uh, introducing your own organization. But you can do that briefly, allowing time for question. This is a question of respect. Mr. Cherum. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I would say that the report that has been submitted on fundamental rights in the EU by Louis Michel, it's a very important uh, report, illustrates well the challenges in the fundamental rights area, the rule of law area, and of course also the interlinkage between rule of law and fundamental rights. The uh, EU Fundamental Rights Agency has now for more than five years been building up an important pool of data on fundamental rights uh, issues uh, throughout the 28 member states. So whereas some years ago, let's say five, six, seven years ago, when we talked about fundamental rights in, in Europe, it was very much, is legislation in place, is the institutions in place, where we knew less, of course, in individual member states, yes, but as a, a EU 28, we didn't have that overview of what is the situation on the ground, how does the legislation, the legal framework, actually impact, impact on people's everyday life. I think we know much more about that today than before. Of course, it's not perfect, but we have definitely come a very long way, be it within the field of discrimination, data protection, protection of the child, and all the different uh, areas that the Fundamental Rights Agency is working on. So where does that leave us? It leaves us, and I'll point to two areas. Firstly, where the problems that we, it leaves us where the problems need to be fully recognized and acknowledge that they exist. And secondly, of course, that action is being taken to address them. So let's take the uh, issue of hate crime, take the outset in that. A crime which is closely linked to minority protection and which has a huge impact on whether you are included or excluded in the European society as a minority. If we look at the data we have, and I will not bore you with all the details, but 25% of the ethnic minorities responding in our EU MITRE survey told us that they were, had been confronted with hate crime within the last 12 months. The same we see in our big survey on LGBT. If we look at the transgender group, 35% of the group, so more than a third throughout the 28 member states, said that they had been confronted with violence. I just recently saw some figures in relation to persons with uh, disabilities, in particular mental health challenges, where they were alarming. It's, I think it is an issue that the agency will look into further. Next week we will launch a report on uh, anti-Semitism uh, in Europe, and here again we see a very high level of fear in this very group of, uh, of uh, hate crime. On top of that, when we ask them, what do you do? Throughout the groups, the mess same message is there. We do not report it to the police. We do not fully trust the police. We do not trust they will do anything to address the issue. So in short, although these figures, as we have them, we so so vast surveys as we do, speak their own clear language. They are far too often still being ignored and even in some places denied. There we have to move. The second point. We have the framework uh, decision and the framework decision on racism and xenophobia has had a very uh, profound impact on the legislation in Europe when it comes to hate crime. That has now been followed with the Victim Directive. I think the Victim Directive is giving us a very important uh, new tool because it also addresses wider groups than the framework decision. So the two in combination, I think, offers a strong outset. 
As underlined in the framework decision race, uh, on racism and uh, xenophobia, racism and xenophobia are di direct violations of the principle of liberty, human rights and rule of law. So hate crime touches more than the victim. It touches also the group that the victim belongs to and in the end it touches the entire society, in particular when these crimes are not being reported. So hate crime can in, in its own way serve as an early indicator of a society that fails to respect fundamental rights values. A sharp increase in incidents combined with insufficient government action to tackle hate crime can be regarded as a clear demonstration of a trend in that particular society. Of course, if we move on, we could say that uh, victims of fundamental rights abuses in general, if they do not have sufficient access to justice, if they have nowhere to turn to to get redress, that again is a clear indicator of some fundamental uh, pillars in society that are not sufficiently strong. Finally, we also see in this regard when we see member states, see states undermining the funding, the independence of the independent structures, national human rights institutions, equality bodies, ombuds uh, institutions, those institutions which are there to offer protection, offer support to the victims of human rights violations. Again, here we have some indicators. So, we have, as I said, data on the situation, the data from the Fundamental Rights Agency, but definitely also from the Council of Europe, from CEPESH, from the uh, Commissioner who's going to speak later, civil society and others. The data is there, it's available. We do know now much more than we did just a few years ago. But in order to objectively and effectively measure the rule of law standing and the human rights standing in Europe, we still need, understandably, commonly endorsed, measurable and actionable indicators. We need to know what is it that we, where is it we feed the data into, what is it we want to, to uh, so to say, take stock of, where is it we want to see the trends. When that is in place, we will be much better, in a much better position to detect trends in key areas of common concern to the European Union. So in conclusion, and I think I'm still within my timing, I don't want to be cut. So in conclusion, given the relevance, as we have heard from the previous speakers, of fundamental rights across so many EU legislative and policy areas, any mechanism to bring these elements under one roof through a common set of indicators would enhance the consistency and coherence of the EU's approach to fundamental rights within its own borders. So linking a little bit to the discussion which was we heard from uh, the presidency of an internal uh, strategy. This would help provide a more comprehensive and nuanced picture of the state of health of the EU, its values and the respect for rule of law. Thank you very much for your attention. We thank you. We thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Morton Jerome, Director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, for your most valuable contribution and also for having helped us so obviously and eloquently to catch up with the timing. <laughs> so first, first uh, we've we got uh, another, another, another contribution to this first panel, which is most, Mr. Mr. Jas Keening, Advocate General for the Court of Justice of the European Union, but I've been told that, regretfully so, Secretary General, Mr. Jaglan has to leave for, a, for an important meeting in London, so we thank him so warmly for having honored this hearing on fundamental rights with his presence and with his presentation. We thank him for being here. Wave you goodbye. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's hear by Mr. Yes, Mr. Jaskinen. With the last panelist on this first panel, and then we will be following with the second panel, and then time for questions and answers. Please, Mr. Jaskin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Deputies, ladies and gentlemen. I try to be brief and 
cut some of my Please, some of the ideas from my original speech. Uh, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to represent the EU Court of Justice at this hearing. It demonstrates the Parliament's devotion to ensuring adherence to principles of democracy, the rule of law, and effective protection of fundamental rights in the European Union. There is, of course, a great deal of work going on at the Court at present that is pertinent to both the state of play of the protection of fundamental rights in Europe and possible solutions in problem areas. That being so, I'm most grateful for the opportunity to share a few reflections on these important subjects. The most important case pending at the Court in this, re in this respect is, of course, opinion. 2213 of the court, which will be issued under Article 218, Paragraph 11 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. This opinion has been sought by the Commission and concerns the draft agreement on the accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights as a contracting party of its own. As this case is currently at the stage of written procedure, I find that it would be inappropriate for me to comment on it. That said, I'd like to emphasize the healthy cooperation that exists between the European Court of Human Rights and the EU Court of Justice. The two jurisdictions are in regular contact, which precipitates fruitfully change of views between the members of these two courts. In this context, I'd like to refer to a recent judgment of the Strasbourg Court in the case of Sofia and Doris Popse versus Austria. It concerned the application of the so-called Brussels 2A regulation on parental responsibility. It was concluded by the European Court of Human Rights that Austria had not infringed the European Human Rights Convention when it implemented a return order for a child that had been issued by an Italian tribunal that was competent, competent under the regulation with respect to the custody of rights of the child. The judgment of the Court of Human Rights in this case has brought clarity to the law because it showed that the EU member states may, without infringing the Convention, apply the basic principle of mutual confidence and continue to recognize and enforce the decisions of the competent tribunal of other member states without infringing the Convention. Thus, some of those uncertainties seem to have disappeared that the earlier case law of the Strasbourg Court relating to intra-EU litigation on parental responsibility may have generated with respect to the foundations of the area of freedom, security and justice. In other words, this judgment of Strasbourg Court seems to acknowledge that the relationship between Austria and Italy is different than, for example, between Austria and Azerbaijan in this respect. But let me turn to the first of the true principal themes of today's discussion, the state of the play in the protection of human rights in Europe and possible solutions. First of all, the court is receiving a significant number of preliminary references from national courts on the interpretation of the EU Charter of fundamental rights. Just to provide an indication, in 2011 there were 27 references as compared to 18 in 2010. In 2012, 41 references were received and in 2013 up to 21st of, 23rd of October, 16 preliminary references arrived at the court. This number of preliminary references shows that at present there seems to be some confusion with respect to the roles of the Strasbourg Court and the EU Court of Justice in the field of human rights and fundamental rights protection. It's sometimes forgotten that the EU Court of Justice is, a, is not a human rights court as such, but the supreme jurisdiction of the European Union. Of course, an important part of the application of the EU law by the Court of Justice consists of the application of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. However, as it, as it is made clear both in the EU, in the treaties and in the Charter itself, the Court of Justice has no competence to apply the European Convention on Human Rights or the Charter 
where the issue at stake falls outside the scope of EU law. Therefore, a great number of preliminary references referring to the Charter have been found to be inadmissible for lack of the necessary link with EU law. This has largely arisen from a wide, widespread but understandable misapprehension on the part of national judges on the circumstances in which the Charter applies to member state conduct. Hopefully, recent judgments of the Court will clarify this issue and help avoid more unnecessary references. Of these recent judgments, I mentioned three. First, it's now established in the NS case that the Charter applies when a member state authority exercises a discretion that is vested in it by virtue of EU law. Secondly, in the seminal Ogever France judgment, the Court also clarified the criteria for the application of the Charter under the arm of Article 55. 51 that concerns whether a member state is implementing EU law. The court held that this criterion would be satisfied upon the establishment of a partial link between the national measure and EU law. In other words, the term member states implementing EU law in Article 51 of the Charter goes beyond national measures that are adopted for the specific purpose of giving effect to a provision of EU law. Thirdly, I'd also note that the Charter can be relevant in litigation before the Member State Courts when a question arises that is exclus exclusively concerned with interpreting the measures of EU law in accordance with the Charter or indeed questioning their validity for failure to comply with fundamental rights. This type of issue arose in the J. McBee case which concerned the EU rules on private international law governing rights of custody. But before, beyond these three circumstances, the Charter has no impact in member state law. A typical example of a misunderstanding of the role of the Charter lies in human rights problems that are purely internal to an individual member state and no rule of EU law is relevant to the resolution of the dispute. The Court has received numerous references that entail this kind of situation. All have been declared inadmissible. I expect, therefore, that in the near future there may be a decline in the number of preliminary references concerning the Charter as national judges become accustomed to the limitations on the circumstances in which it is applicable in the Member States. Finally, I'd like to refer to two important features of the Charter. First, unlike the European Convention on Human Rights, the Charter has rightly, in my view, adopted a comprehensive approach towards fundamental rights protection by including within, within its ambit economic, cultural and social rights. In this sense, the Charter follows the example of the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The area of economic, social and cultural rights is starting to come alive in the Court's case law. Here I would, for example, refer to the recent struck judgment of September this year. There the Court, under its exceptional review procedure, declared that the judgment of the General Court in case Commission versus Strax adversely affected the unity and consistency of European Union law. This was because the General Court, as an appeal court, in its reinterpretation of the staff regulations, disregarded the right to paid annual leave as a principle of social law of the European Union, expressly affirmed by Article 31, Paragraph 2 of the Charter. Secondly, another important aspect of the Court's activity in the field of fundamental and human rights relates to guaranteeing the fundamental right to an effective remedy. This difficult task has been especially apparent in the numerous cases relating to counter-terrorism and the freezing of funds of individuals. These kind of cases are, of course, first decided by the General Court. Indeed, Article 47 of the Charter is perhaps applied in the court, Court's case law more often than any other provision of the Charter. <coughs> 
and this illustrates the importance of effective judicial remedies in the European Union, both at the national level and before the court itself. Therefore, I'd like to end my speech by ex expressing my regrets that the member states have not yet reached a solution to the problem how to select additional judges to the general court. The general court suffers despite the progress it has achieved in reforming its internal working methods from a backlog of cases and lengthy duration of proceedings. This is to the detriment of both individuals and, under and undertakings. As we all know, charity begins at home. This equally applies to effective judicial protection. Therefore, it is very much hoped at the Court of Justice that, that this issue will be solved in a satisfactory way. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je, je... Thank you very much. In, the first, in this first session. Uh, so there will be a questions and answers time after the next panel. Now, uh, may I ask all the people who are uh, at the podium to leave the podium because we need some seats. And uh, I invite the Commissioner, Mr. Nils Moesnitz, to come to the podium. Alors, nous allons d'abord écouter. Le... So, first of all, we're going to hear the Commissioner, who I welcome with great pleasure. And then after his presentation, we've got a connection with Strasbourg. We're going to listen to Madame Zimmler, who's a judge at the European Court of Human Rights. So, Mr. Musnix, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be in Brussels to meet with EU partners to talk about human rights within the EU. Most of my conversations about human rights in Brussels are about human rights outside the EU. Uh, a couple of words about my mandate. Uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights is an independent, impartial, non-judicial institution of the Council of Europe, uh, covering all 47 member states, including all EU member states. Independent means I take no instructions from anybody. Uh, impartial means I must treat all member states on an equal basis. And non-judicial means that my decisions are not binding. I work through persuasion and dialogue with member states. And the primary working method is country visits, uh, followed by reports. Um, in the one and a half years of my six-year mandate, I have visited uh, 14 countries with full reports, including eight EU member states. Uh, these are in chronological order, Portugal, Austria, Finland, Italy, the Czech Republic, Spain, Greece, Estonia. I'll be visiting Denmark in November. Uh, I've engaged with substantive letters uh, with a number of other, or m memos uh, on human rights issues with a number of other member states, including Croatia, Ireland, Slovenia, France, and the UK, and media interventions on just about all member states. Uh, the most frequent topics that I have encountered uh, on country visits to EU countries are the impact of the crisis on vulnerable groups, in, partic in particular children, older persons, persons with disabilities. Uh, this is reflected in reports on Portugal, Spain, Estonia. Issues pertaining to migration, asylum, uh, and racism in the reports on Italy and Greece, uh, but also in various interventions in Austria, Germany, Hungary, and others. Uh, issues pertaining to Roma rights, uh, and racism against Roma in the Czech Republic, in Portugal, Greece, uh, France, Slovakia, Romania, Sweden, and elsewhere. Uh, LGBT rights, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender persons um, in Portugal, Croatia, Finland, Ireland. Uh, police misconduct in a number of countries, uh, Spain, Greece, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and the administration of justice in Italy. So a very wide spectrum uh, of topics. A few observations on what I have learned um, in my country visits. Uh, in countries undergoing fiscal co consolidation, uh, governments and parliaments often forget to assess the impact of consolidation measures on vulnerable groups. And they very often point to the EU and the Troika uh, as holding some of the blame. Um, there is a need for human rights compliant responses to austerity. Uh, next month we will be publishing an issue paper on safeguarding human rights in times of austerity uh, in one month's time. 
Um, regarding disability rights, uh, the UN Disability Rights Convention is the first human rights treaty to which the EU is a party. Uh, and one of the crucial provisions is, has to do with the rights of persons to live uh, independently and to be included in the community. Uh, and this is incompatible with living in large institutions which are segregated. Um, I have called on all member states, and I hope that you will do so as well, to, to stop placing persons in, uh, in segregated institutions and to develop uh, plans for deinstitutionalization. I've received persistent reports that EU structural funds are being used in EU member states to refurbish and prop up uh, old large institutions or even to build new ones. Uh, and this is in breach of the UN Convention, and it Im implicates not only uh, the rights of persons with disabilities in the member states, but also the EU. It's EU money uh, being used for purposes counter to human rights. <clears throat> Another aspect that I have engaged with in a number of uh, contexts has to do with migration and asylum, uh, the long detention of migrants and asylum seekers uh, in member states is unjustified and counterproductive. Uh, after a maximum of several weeks to three months, you know whether you can deport somebody. You don't need to hold them for 18 months. Uh, detention traumatizes children and stigmatizes all migrants as being criminals. Dublin returns, I have found, create unsustainable pressures on uh, certain EU member states which are most exposed to migratory pressures. This system is unraveling due to legal challenges at the national uh, and European level. And it will have to be replaced by something. Uh, some states have incomplete anti-discrimination frameworks with differing levels of protection depending on the ground of discrimination. And they point to the EU and say we're only implementing EU directives. Uh, <clears throat> Roma are still widely segregated in housing and education uh, in member states. Uh, there is a significant number who are stateless. They are subject to discrimination and violence. Many states say they are dutifully implementing uh, framework strategies on, on Roma integration, uh, but they often forget to combat anti-Gypsyism as a part of those strategies. It's not required by the EU guidelines. Uh, my cooperation with the EU uh, takes place uh, within the EU it has to, is primarily with the Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, who's de which produces excellent data on, on a number of human rights issue areas. Uh, we try to integrate their data into our reports and to confront member states with it. We also have good cooperation on, uh, with national human rights structures. Uh, the EU, this is a key point, the EU has limited legislative competence in many human rights issue areas. Where are the directives on freedom of expression, prohibition of torture, the right to a fair trial? There are none. Uh, I would like to see the EU do much more, do much better in those areas where it has the strongest competence. Anti-discrimination, gender equality, disability rights because you ratified the convention, data protection, and some aspects of asylum and migration. This is my key point. Do better where you have competence now. The Council of Europe uh, can improve and complement EU policy by filling in some gaps. On data protection, as the Secretary General mentioned, uh, there is a, a case law in the European Court of Human Rights. EU data protection law ends where national security begins. And as we know from Mr. Snowden, that's a pretty big chunk of territory. On migration and asylum, <clears throat> I think that Council of Europe standards uh, can help to challenge the widespread criminalization and detention of migrants and asylum seekers, the frequent lack of an immigrant integration policy. Uh, we can highlight the impact of Dublin returns on the countries and the individuals concerned. We can highlight the negative human rights impact of the EU's efforts to externalize migration policy to its neighbors. Today, we launch an issue paper on the right to leave a country. This implicates the EU. Uh, which has tried to externalize some of its migration policy uh, to the Western Balkans, to Turkey, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to Ukraine, uh, and is complicit in some of the human rights violations uh, that occur there in the context of migration policy. While there are some tentative EU efforts to engage on the right to a fair trial and uh, the judiciary through the prism of efficiency, I would love to see the EU do much more uh, with regard to the implementation of European Court of Human Rights judgments. Uh, 
uh, particularly pilot judgments, which point to uh, systemic problems in member states. Uh, the EU does this in its enlargement policy and its external action. I would like to see it take up pilot judgments as a matter of priority in member states as well. I can also speak uh, to my cooperation with the EU and non-EU member states, which is more systematic, uh, but that is not the focus of today's hearing. Uh, our cooperation is good. It can be intensified. Uh, and I would just remind you that I am the Commissioner for Human Rights of all the 28 member states of the EU as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you. We well, thank you for your statement, sharp, right to our hearts and brains, both at the same time. Not bad. We well, thank you for that. And now I think we've got a video conference ready to uh, listen to yet another yes guest speaker, who is Ineta Zimele, judge of the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you so much for having accepted our invitation. You're most welcome to deliver your video conference in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. You've got the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for this kind invitation extended to the European Court of Human Rights uh, and myself in the capacity of the judge uh, at the European Court of Human Rights to participate uh, in the public hearing on fundamental rights, uh, since uh, we consider it very important also to have this possibility to share our own reflections and uh, experience um, with you. Um, in a very short time uh, allocated to me, I shall uh, uh, introduce a few very modest uh, observations. Uh, the first will concern the ever stronger constitutionalization of the integration process of the European Union as uh, uh, certainly brought about and strengthened with the adoption of the Fundamental Rights Charter. And the second will concern the accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights and the lessons that one may already discern from this process. Now, evidently, uh, I'm not able to deal with the entire spectrum of uh, mechanisms at play European Union that are or ought to be used for a more prominent and streamlined protection of fundamental rights within the EU's institutional actions and in the member states. I think the draft report that also was, was shared with me captures uh, all of these aspects and venues. I will just underline the importance of the basic principle that each decision-making in the European Union, like in any of the European states, should be assessed before and after in view of its compliance with relevant fundamental rights. In other words, even if the European Union is not a state, the agreement was reached in the treaty. In matters of fundamental rights, it should act like any other democracy which complies with its Bill of Rights. If this is accepted, there are of course complex legal issues primarily related to the questions of EU's competences and their limits that need to be discussed, and you are discussing that. More streamlined protection of fundamental rights in the European Union is closely linked and dependent on the EU's integration process and agreements between states, an area uh, I think where the whole spectrum of difficulties is present is, for example, the area of protection of asylum seekers in the European Union, and that is also mentioned in the draft report, and rightly so. Indeed, the means to bring about a more coherent approach to fundamental rights in the European Union's decision-making and despite different types of competences of the EU in different areas, it would be useful and necessary to afford the Fundamental Rights Agency with a more prominent role in providing its advice to decision-makers on aspects of fundamental rights. 
Now, my second point, the accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights is indeed a very important example of both. The synergies between the two systems and the way to strengthen the protection of fundamental rights in the European Union and on the European continent. Why? First, the European Convention on Human Rights provides for a minimum common standard of human rights for Europe. The question normally should not arise on the possible inconsistency between the European Union law and the European Convention on Human Rights, since the, since the presumption must be that the European Union law goes beyond the European minimum in matters of human rights. However, in order to achieve in practice that European Union institutions not only act in accordance with the minimum human rights standard as reflected in the Convention, but also go beyond it, as the spirit and letter of the Charter suggests, some work has to be done at home, as just pointed out. At the same time, the accession is an important example of so much needed streamlining of procedures at the European level. It is a way to avoid conflicting obligations that might be imposed on states. Once accession is completed, it will provide a clear guidance for national courts as to who, in what circumstances, will have a last word on the minimum human rights standard. I would add that the decision on accession, which took a long time, as you know, and continues to take time until its full implementation, shows that rationalization of human rights protection mechanisms in Europe is possible. I would say that there is uh, for some time already a need to reflect on ways how to rationalize the mechanisms that we national and regional levels. The European Union should all already now be reflecting not only on how to increase its in-house expertise in fundamental rights, and it is in this point that a better cooperation with the other European human rights mechanisms should really be explored, but also on how to arrive at most rational procedures for making sure that decision-making uh, within the European Union is fundamental rights compliant. And there are many lessons that can be learned from uh, the processes uh, that uh, we have gone through in Europe in creating uh, various human rights mechanisms. I would therefore, first of all, examine uh, what are the mechanisms and ways to ensure that European Union institutions and Member States comply with fundamental rights in a sense how effective are preventive, warning and awareness raising mechanisms. And then, only then, I would develop an elaborate system of, of penalties that, that is also one of the subject matters in the draft report. Um, I've been very short. Uh, I can sum up my two main points. Um, I should say that uh, there are important regional and national traditions which can and should instruct the European Union in creating a proper in-house mechanism. It is important to take stock of the expertise gained outside the European Union and you've discussed that, not least in the Council of Europe. I'm also sure that the accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights has not exhausted all the possibilities for a better reflected European system of protection of human rights. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.
very much for that very interesting contribution, and I hope we can have the text of your speech because that will feed into my report. Now, we've heard a number of speakers. I think we should, could take some questions now, so I would ask members and uh, members of the public as well to ask questions. This question time. Um, cannot last more than 10 to 15 minutes. Mrs. Morvai. Thank you very much. I would like to speak in Hungarian. Now, the situation of the fundamental rights within the EU is the topic of today's hearing. Now, among the such fundamental rights, we find uh, classical, traditional, political rights about which we didn't hear a word today. So. Uh, what's the case, what's the situation in this uh, Europe where people are appalled and are going on streets? What about the right to uh, express opinions, to the right of gathering uh, Why that drives people to... Uh, to the streets. Because, and I would like to hear about these because I do believe that this way people could be, could have a say in decision making. Um, certain groups uh, being denied their rights, uh, we have heard about. We have heard about anti Semitism, um, um, hate crimes against um, uh, the Roma, etc. But this time, uh, just like no other time before, we haven't heard a word about other groups, such as um, um, ethnic minorities. Uh, do the members of the Honorable Memo uh, that the accession um, that in Serbia, with whom we have already uh, quite progressed um, a state of negotiations, Hungarian nationals, ethnic minorities, uh, are beaten up simply because they are Hungarians, that you cannot uh, speak in Hungarian uh, in the streets because you are getting beaten up. Uh, and we could speak about ethnic cleansing. Uh, now, where do these people get uh, protection? Where are their rights protected? We are talking about the protection of protecting. I'm sorry, but we have to leave time for everybody. Uh, I'm going to limit speaking time to one minute per person. So let me just uh, add that the case is the same in Slovakia and uh, the position of uh, the petition uh, committee was outrageous concerning the Slovak um, uh, situation, the Benes decrees uh, and uh, that civil initiatives have been turned down. Who is going to protect the rights of these people? And I'm inviting your opinion where they can they turn to, how uh, wishes, how does the EU uh, or the Council uh, of Europe wish to uh, represent the interest of uh, uh, um, ethnic Hungarians uh, and their rights. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I also agree that um, it is much easier to discuss human rights problems in third countries than in the European Union. I think you were the one who mentioned this. It is quite a sensitive issue to speak about ourselves. Uh, in one hand, it is also true that uh, the EU has limited legislative competence in human rights uh, issues and we have to improve our, uh, our record. But what we see as a, as a real problem and dilemma that we are much better in monitoring the individual aspects of the human rights situation, democracy situation, rule of law situation in the, uh, also in our countries than to have an assessment on the overall picture about the systemic problems and systemic violations on all of this. Uh, so I would be glad to hear about uh, your opinion and uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this systemic type of problems and how to develop uh, our instruments in this field, uh, which might be a solution for the so-called Copenhagen dilemma that we are struggling with uh, quite often. I think it is, uh, it is something which is very important. The other, if I have, still have some, uh, some time, then we know that the Charter of Fundamental Rights is enforceable by the EU institutions that just in case if member states are transposing and implementing EU law. 
what we see quite often in the petition committee, but it is the same uh, in the EU court, that uh, most of the complaints are coming from, uh, from citizens uh, related to this field um, uh, where there is no EU competence and there is a certain level, a very high level of frustration because people would like to see more role in the EU level also intervening in these human rights violation cases. So I would be glad to hear about these two issues uh, from, from the presenters, from our guests. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame. Uh, Monsieur Kirkhoop. Chairman, first of all, my apologies for not being here throughout uh, this session so far. Um, I really just want to uh, make two points, one specific uh, area and one more general point. And that is that, um, of course, we have to be careful in our parliament here all the time because obviously we're not a court of law. We're not here to judge our fellow member states, uh, which sometimes I think comes through in the report. And I'm, I'm not too happy with that. But I would like to just pick up on the Roma issues um, as been mentioned uh, already, uh, but I think it's vital that we, don't, we do not condone discriminatory actions against Roma and certainly not in areas such as health care, housing, education and employment. The annual report does nothing really to address the internal problems within the communities themselves. The high incidence of trafficking and child abduction, for instance, the high numbers of uh, Roma women who are forced into prostitution by, by their own uh, menfolk. The report doesn't mention that significant numbers of children in Roma communities are not registered and therefore do not attend school, even where attempts are being made to help them. And I think that we need to see that the member states work closer with Roma communities so that we can actually make sure that rights and responsibilities are understood and deployed. Um, and I actually finally would want to say this. I do believe the European Parliament, uh, whilst it should not be a ju in judgment, I think it should be an exporter and a promoter of fundamental rights and the issues associated. People respecting each other and treating each other in a manner which they themselves like to be treated is always, has been and will be a fundament for a harmonious society. It's one of the major institutions in the world representing a significant proportion of the world's population. We in Europe have a global voice and it's right that we should use it to promote the importance of mutual respect among all people. I think the report, to, I'm pleased to say, does refer to these facts uh, in general terms, and I would very much want to subscribe to such sentiments. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Madame. Thank you very much. Madame Lunacek. Merci. Um, chair and uh, members of the panel and, and others, I'd, I'd like to follow up mainly on, on one issue, and I think Kinga Gerns also mentioned it and others uh, that spoke before. The problem that we sometimes have in, in speaking about uh, the issues, on, especially like on fundamental rights, on human rights violations inside the European Union, because as others have said, it's sometimes difficult to criticize each other, but I think it's important, and it's not like, as Mr. Kirkhope sort of said, we're not here to judge other member states. I think as a family of EU member states and of, with the common European Union, like in a family, it is important to also talk about the problems we have inside this family and not just close our eyes and do as if uh, they didn't exist. In that sense, I very much appreciate the report that uh, Louis Michel has prepared for now, and I think it's a very good basis for having a common and, and important fundamental rights um, report here in this parliament. I'd like to go to just one issue. Um, we have for the EU27 economic policy, which is a common economic policy, we have um, country-specific recommendations done every year. Yeah? They are done, they're prepared, the Commission does that, and uh, the um, tables for that are prepared by the Economic Governance Unit of the European Parliament. So, if we have a European common economic policy, why shouldn't we do the same for European fundamental rights policy? Um, and the idea would be, and I'd like to know from you what you, what you think of that idea, to have, uh, for example, the European Parliament Policy Department prepare comparative and synthetic country-by-country -country tables on fundamental rights, and the, or do it with the Fundamental Rights Agency, whoever, uh, that I think we can decide, and then ask the Commission to do every year country-by-country -country specific recommendations on fundamental rights policy. If we have that, since we have that already for economic policy, why shouldn't we be doing, we do, be doing it as well for fundamental rights? 
It's common policies we have, it's common frameworks we have, and I think that would really be a very good idea. And it would maybe help those who think that it's about judging each other in a negative way. Yeah? It's about looking into issues every year and seeing, well, where's improvement, where are best practices, where things have gotten worse. I think that would help those who think criticism is only against one country Merci, or one Madame. nation. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur de... Thank you very much, Mr. Doyon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've got actually two questions uh, that um, the Commission could usefully answer somehow. We, we've heard the Secretary General of the Council of Europe uh, calling for accession by the European Union to the European Social Charter, uh, which I think is an excellent idea, but I've, I didn't hear the, Mr. Nimitz uh, answering that uh, call at all, so I would like to uh, know a bit what, where the Commission stands in that respect, and also I think it could affect uh, the contents of your report, uh, uh, Mr. Michel. Uh, secondly, um, we also know that uh, in the case of Greece, for example, but also Portugal, um, the uh, committee, uh, supervisory committee of the Social Charter said that there was a violation of the Social Charter um, by these countries, and these countries referred back to the Troika that is, the Commission, inter alia. So I wonder, again, whether the Commission also uh, applies impact assessments, uh, including the social dimension in the European Social Charter, before it issues certain recommendations uh, to these countries in the Troika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruns. Yes, we've heard a lot about democracy and the rule of law this afternoon, but of course these can be interpreted just as the political class wishes them to be. To quote Humpty Dumpty, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. The EU has been very critical of the Hungarian government for tinkering with its constitution, but it's been strangely quiet about Greece, which has arrested MPs of an opposition party, the first arrest since the fall of the colonels. A left-wing activist was horribly murdered by a supporter, but not a member of that party. This transformed the party overnight into a criminal organisation, which, unlike parties, can be banned. Prejudging the verdict, funding has been withdrawn in advance. Belgium has banned a political party. Germany attempted to ban one on fabricated evidence. Freedom of speech is curtailed in many countries in the EU, and the threshold falls well short of incitement to violence. We've heard the word xenophobia used this afternoon, literally fear of strangers, really a thought crime in the Orwellian sense. The words hate crime have also been used, but of course not defined, because they're not intended to convey a precise concept, they convey a subliminal message to stop listening to the accused. This afternoon has not so much been about fundamental rights, but about selective concern and repression of legitimate dissent. Merci. Je vais maintenant... Thank you very much. I will now ask uh, Madam the Judge to reply to some of the questions, and that would be most comfortable for everybody. So if uh, you'd like to reply, Madam, then you have the floor. Merci <coughs> beaucoup. I could probably uh, uh, pick on, on a few aspects uh, raised uh, in the, the questions and comments. And uh, probably the most fundamental question is whether um, there are sufficient mechanisms at the national level and European level to react to different types of uh, alleged human rights violations. Uh, I think it was the, the member of the uh, uh, Hungarian uh, parliament. Um, well, I would say the following. This is exactly the point I was making. I think um, in Europe we have created the whole palette, the whole spectrum of uh, various mechanisms. And I suspect that uh, it is very easy to get lost uh, in this, uh, this, this uh, forest uh, of the mechanisms. Probably the time has come and the accession of the EU to the European Convention and now the next issue uh, that was also asked is a very important question on the accession to the social charter. This is the process where we really need to streamline uh, the protection mechanisms that are available to European citizens so that it is very clear to them 
uh, if they don't achieve justice at the national level, and then normally what, what happens actually was uh, also with the examples of, uh, of uh, violations of freedom of expression, for example, you would have a case in the European Court of Human Rights, or you would have the discussion uh, within the Council of Europe framework, uh, within the context of advisory committee, uh, working, uh, uh, monitoring the uh, implementation of the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. So there are these various instruments and, and what is really necessary is to see where the, the, the European Union could uh, um, uh, strengthen these mechanisms that already exist, could help the streamlining these mechanisms and could learn experiences outside for its own uh, internal decision-making processes, for its own sort of uh, reactions to the various issues brought about. I think this, this, is, this becomes extremely, um, extremely important uh, for everyone, for all of the institutions in, on the European continent. Um, yes, I think as far as, as, as I am concerned, uh, and one more, uh, one more point, of course, uh, with the accession, and we, we hope that it will take, finally take place sooner than later, with the accession, accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights, then a number of these issues of violations of fundamental rights passing through the mechanisms in the European Union might also uh, get, get channeled to the European Court of Human Rights. So it's not that we do not have uh, protection mechanisms. I think we are lost in, in, in a little bit in how many they are and the fact that we, they need to be joined, streamlined, etc. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Your Honour. Are there any speakers who would like to reply to the questions that were asked? Uh, Commissioner. Merci. Uh, a couple of comments on grouping together some of the, the questions. Uh, hate speech, there is a case law on hate speech in the European Court of Human Rights, which does not punish, hate speech is not people being punished for their thoughts, it's for inciting people to violence or discrimination. Discrimination, racially motivated violence, this is not thought, this is not dissent. These are crimes under human rights law. Uh, and the members of Golden Dawn in Greece who have been arrested have very often been engaged in violent attacks against migrants and minorities. These have been documented, these have been filmed. These people are not just dissenting, they are beating up people on the streets and they should be punished for doing that. <coughs> Excuse me, you had your say. Uh, regarding the Hungarian question, uh, Hungarian minorities, I think if you look more broadly, you might have missed the discussion on hate crime, which affects Hungarian minorities as well. The same people who would beat up Roma outside of Hungary would beat up LGBT people and would beat up ethnic minorities, including Hungarians. So if you want to promote their protection, you should promote laws and enforcement of uh, laws against hate crimes, hate speech, and discrimination. And this is an area where the EU has a certain amount of competence because of the framework decision and the race directive. <clears throat> Regarding systemic problems, I highlighted the importance of pilot judgments. These are not judgments like any other in the, in the European Court of Human Rights. They group together large categories of cases, and they point to systemic problems. It differs by country. Could be the lack of a domestic remedy, length of proceedings, conditions of detention, uh, but these are very serious problems, and if this pilot judgment system does not work, we're back to square one in the European Court of Human Rights, the backlog of cases, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very important. Uh, why aren't pilot judgments, what is the root behind pilot ju judgments? Sometimes it's a lack of money. More often it's a lack of political will. Very often it's ingrained practices and uh, vested interests. Take the segregation of Roma. Uh, or the segregation of persons and disabilities. Uh, <clears throat> very often you have very strong financial interests at work. You have whole lobbies of defectologists, of uh, <clears throat> people dealing with uh, <clears throat> uh, placing children in, in, in persons with mild mental disabilities. You have funding systems that sustain this. Uh, you have whole cadres of teachers who are afraid that they will not be able to find work elsewhere. So you have to, there is a human, there's a human rights prism through which you view this, but I think you have to look at the vested interests and the ingrained practices uh, that are behind them. Uh, 
I think this issue of segregating people by ethnicity, especially Roma, but also persons with disabilities into big institutions and so on, segregating migrants into detention facilities. Uh, sometimes uh, it is a cause of discrimination, but sometimes people self-segregate as well and self-isolate. Uh, and I think this is what we have to get at. This is a fundamental problem. If we don't deal with issues of segregation and separation, uh, then uh, the, there's an incredibly fertile ground for intolerance and, 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 uh, and racism, but also um, uh, discrimination against persons with disabilities. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we have a question here. Thank you very much for that. And just for those replies, I'd just like to say that I fully share everything that you've said on all of those different subjects. I would even almost ask for you to become a European Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, just want to, on uh, Hungary and, and hate crime, Hungarians. Uh, just want to again, as uh, the uh, presidency already said, talked about our conference on hate crime that will take place in Vilnius uh, next week. Uh, of course, uh, national minorities, uh, any sort of hate crime, any sort of biased, motivated crime which is the definition of hate crime, uh, would be addressed there. So I don't think there's any sort of discrimination in the field of, of hate crime, definitely not from uh, uh, our side. And I think uh, to Mr. Bronze, uh, already here, I, I uh, replied to his question on the definition. There are definitions. It's bias-motivated uh, crime. Uh, it's when you are being attacked because of whom you are and not necessarily what you have done, which, which definitely is, a, let's say, a, a key feature of the uh, definition. We have made a publication a year ago that uh, I can refer you to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to briefly uh, add a few points about the uh, scope scope of European Union law fundamental rights protection. So, of course, we should all accept that the basic system is always the national constitutional protection of fundamental rights. That's the system which has to be in order. Then we have these international law minimal standards which are applied by the Strasbourg Court. And the role of the European Union Court is to apply the Charter, and the Charter, the charter applies there where the where European Union law applies. So the scope of European Union law defines also the scope of application of the Charter. But this said, the Court has accepted in its case law, for example, in Okeper, France, and judgment, that even if the Charter applies, it doesn't mean that the member states could not apply the fundamental rights. So the court has said that if the level of protection provided by the Charter and primacy, unity, and effectiveness of EU law are not comprised, member states are free to apply also the national constitutional protection of fundamental rights in the scope of the European Union law. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I apologize for Mr. Nemitz, who had to leave earlier, uh, but I, I heard some questions addressed to the Commission in the discussion, and I take uh, some of those points. There was a direct question concerning the accession to the Social Charter by the, uh, by the EU and what is the stand in the Commission currently. Uh, well, our priority is uh, first to uh, take the mandate of the treaties to accede to the European Convention on Human Rights. So this work has currently the priority and also then the preparation of the internal rules. Uh, so we are not yet uh, uh, working or thinking on the accession to the Social Charter. Uh, but I take what was just said also by the Advocate General Yan and that naturally the member states are parties and, and should uh, respect that also when implementing union law and uh, all the work in the framework of the European semester. There I would stress that the Commission, uh, for us, it is important indeed to take also into account the social dimension of the uh, uh, economic and, and 
Monetary Union and the Commission just uh, last month uh, published a communication on the following on the ben different benchmarks on the social dimension on the Economic and Monetary Union in order to increase that aspect in the European semester in the work on the uh, econ also in the work on the economic recovery programs. And there it was mentioned uh, also the work that how we, we should uh, take into account the fundamental rights in the economic and financial area and, and uh, 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 Commission mentioned, uh, for example, the deinstitutionalization uh, as, as a part of implementing the UN Convention of the Disability. Uh, this is something our, this has been the, the general line and we have already a long time uh, followed uh, this policy, for example, of the deinstitutionalization of the children as a part of the rights of the child policy. And now when the union indeed is uh, um, has acceded to the UN Convention on the Disability, we can actually broaden this in the implementation on the uh, Union uh, uh, structural and, and regional programs also under the next uh, financial perspective. Thank you. Bien, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'd just like to very quickly state that I'm not going to reply to all of the different comments. Of course, I've duly noted everything that's been said as rapporteur, but I would just like to make a couple of reflections. There are some MEPs that I respect greatly, but Mr. Kirkhope said that we shouldn't judge, but we're not talking about judging here. We're just talking about, I think there's a misunderstanding here, I don't understand this, but we're just talking about exercising the rights and the obligations of MEPs to scrutinize the implementation of the commitments that have been made by the different member states when they acceded to the European Treaty. No more, no less. Therefore, I don't think you can uh, accuse MEPs uh, of having that value judgment. Of course, being an MEP means you have an opinion. And Mr. Kirkhope, I would say that I sh share very few of your ideas, but I do think here that perhaps sometimes you have well-founded arguments, but here I don't think uh, you should come he here and uh, say that it's always just a, a value judgment. That's not always. That's not the case. With we are just respecting the commitments made by member states, and we've got to. Our job is to control whether that's being done or not. So I think it's my duty to say that. I think that's important. And also, Madame Lunacek made a proposal, and I don't think there's been a negative judgment here. If we have a, a scoreboard that allows us to really compare the human rights performance of each member state. And I would say, without trying to provoke, that there'll be a personal annex uh, of the human rights situation in each country. Perhaps you won't be pleased about that, but I think it's uh, my duty as rapporteur to state what is uh, happening in all European member states as well as talking about all the different bodies and agencies. Now, there are different points of view here. There are people like me who think that with the current treaty we could go much further to respect human rights in different member states. We could do a lot more than is being done at the moment. And the Commissioner said we are seeing a distinct lack of will and I think we shouldn't just uh, rely on the European Council to act there. I've been uh, p part of the European Council. I know that it's a friendly atmosphere. We're not all that ambitious there. And finally, I think we need to admit, and this is the aim of the discussion, is that there are two schools of thought. There are those who think we can go further right now without waiting for treaty modification, and there are others who are hiding behind the treaty modification, waiting for that to be ambitious, and perhaps it will take 10, 15, 20 years before responsibility is shouldered in each member state as regards human rights. But these are political issues. We're not tr 
making that judgment. But uh, if politics isn't uh, to do with uh, drawing those conclusions, then what's this about? But I'll just say that uh, the debate isn't over in the European Parliament, and we'll move on to the next item. Yes, of course. Thank you. Now it's, it, it's time to move on, but first we thank Mr. Mutzdeck, the Commissioner on Human Rights, and the rest of the panelists here. Of course, they got a gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaskinen. Thank you all, the participants of this first round, which gives us room to move on to the second panel, session two. We would like to invite speakers of a panel today, last panel today, take the podium, Mr. Bigger, Mrs. Grab, Mr. Cataldi, Mr. Carrera. Yes, how are you? Welcome. You're all most welcome. We will be in this panel discussing the uh, strengthening of fundamental rights protection. We're first going to hear from Director of Amnesty International European Office. Mr. Bigger, for the next 10 minutes. There you got the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak here today at today's hearing. I'm very honored to be able to represent a part of civil society. My name is Nicholas Bigger, and I'm the director of Amnesty International here in Brussels. But my intervention today also represents the views of the Human Rights and Democracy Network, a network of 47 human rights NGOs. Let me get straight to the point. We have one key expectation of the EU when it comes to fundamental rights. The EU must finally acknowledge the need for and further articulate a comprehensive EU human rights framework, strategy and an action plan to guide its human rights work at home. Without this plan, we believe the EU response to human rights challenges faced by member states will indeed remain inadequate, insufficient and piecemeal. Today, when human rights organizations, or indeed individuals or groups themselves, challenge the EU institutions to act against human rights abuses in member states, we more often than not receive a list of ongoing activities that too often only remotely link to or sometimes fail to address our concerns at all. We also more often than not told to address the Council of Europe, national governments, or the courts instead. But as human rights actors, we dare to challenge this. What we rightly expect from the European Union as a union of values is that all its actors share a collective responsibility for responding to human rights challenges faced in member states and to establish enforceable mechanisms at the EU level to enhance the protection of human rights across the region. Let me give you just a few examples, and there are many more, I assure you, to illustrate the type of responses that we have received from the European Commission and the European Council in recent times. There are a new first one, there's a new report from the Fundamental Rights Agency and also a report from Amnesty International that highlights a worrying trend of homophobic and transphobic hate crime in the EU. We hear that the EU is reviewing the implementation of its provisions on racist crimes, which is another form of hate crime, and that the proposal for a horizontal directive covering discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, which doesn't cover hate crime, is stuck in the Council. These are the typical two responses and the only ones we ever get. This is not enough. We must hear what action the EU will actually initiate to combat homophobic and transphobic hate crime in member states. There's a recent European Parliament resolution, yet again endorsed in the, in the draft report of Mr. Michel, that reminds the other institutions about concrete recommend, recommendations made to them last year regarding investigations into alleged torture and enforced disappearances. This was in the context of member states' collaboration with the CIA rendition and secret detention program. We hear only two insufficient things in response whenever we raise a question. That the EU now has a legal instrument for cooperation with the US on extradition. And that it cannot interfere with matters relating to the activities of intelligence services. This again is not enough. We must hear what action the EU will actually initiate to address situations where member states act outside of any rule of law framework. And we need to know why intelligence services activities can be discussed in Council in relation to violation of the right to privacy, as we've just seen in terms of the NSA surveillance, but not when they have led to other human rights violations, such as torture. 
And finally, an example that shows the abysmal lack of putting a broader human rights framework at the center of a discussion. The European Council, 10 days ago, met to find an urgent response to the tragedy of people dying in the Mediterranean when trying to reach safety in Europe. They left with an empty promise to propose concrete solutions later, in 2014, by reinforcing exactly the kind of EU policies that so often allow for these strategies in the first place. Not only is this not enough, it is putting people's lives at risk directly. We must hear what our EU leaders will actually do to protect the lives and rights of migrants, asylum seekers and refugees coming to Europe. So the EU needs an overarching human rights strategy with the whole of Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union at its starting point. That is to say, the founding values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. Without this, the response to the human rights challenges it faces will remain at best defensive and reactive instead of protective and proactive. The EU needs this overarching human rights strategy to enable it to, one, think human rights outside the box, and two, join the human rights dots between EU policies, so migration, anti-discrimination, criminal justice, and its existing tools, the Charter, infringement procedures, implementation reports, Article 7, etc. If we don't have that, it will remain difficult to properly assess human rights violations within the EU and identify where there's already room for action at the EU level or where new initiatives may be needed. So a strategic plan for EU human rights action would, provide immediate, would not provide immediate or magic solutions to end violations, that is clear. But it will help the EU institutions to confront the reality of human rights violations EU member states, devise effective actions to address abuses and ensure accountability for what the EU tools deliver or don't deliver. The human rights package adopted by the Foreign Affairs Council in June 2012 should be a source of inspiration when planning and implementing a comprehensive EU human rights framework strategy and action plan internally. It is a powerful pledge by Member States, the External Action Service, European Parliament and the Commission to jointly advance the protection and promotion of human rights with specific responsibilities attached to each, putting human rights at the heart of EU policy. Amnesty International and the Human Rights and Democracy Network are certainly encouraged by the debate that started under the Irish Presidency and the need for a new mechanism to address the shortcomings of the EU response to human rights. But we caution an approach that seems to contemplate the establishment of a mechanism that will only address exceptional crisis situations involving rule of law in the narrowest sense. This mechanism may well be welcome as a missing piece in the EU's architectural puzzle, but not in a vacuum, detached from the reality of human rights violations on the ground. Without being part of an overall strategic problem project, it will simply lead to the same old responses and we have stacks of letters that make the exact same, always same responses that we got. And they're always the same evasion of addressing the issue. Let me end with a call to the honorable members of this house. You have in front of you a very constructive and forward-looking draft report submitted by Mr. Louis Michel. We need you to endorse this report. But endorse it together with one key amendment, and a more explicit call for a comprehensive EU human rights framework strategy an action plan on the internal front. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup, Thank you. Now, Mrs. Graba, Director of, um, uh, Director of Open Society, European Policy Institute, Open Society Foundations, EU Affairs. Um, I work for the Open Society Foundations, which has worked for more than three decades to promote human rights, justice, democracy, and accountability of governments to their citizens in more than 100 countries throughout the world. And when we were set up, we were focused almost, almost exclusively in parts of the world that were not EU member states. Um, and it is with great regret that we've had to start working on problems with fundamental rights within the borders of the European Union. We never used to have to do that. Um, now, it's easy to blame the economic crisis for many of the problems that are now arising. It's true that economic pressures lead to social pressures, and I very much welcome uh, what uh, Commissioner Nils Muzniak said earlier this afternoon about uh, his uh, forthcoming report on those issues. We also have to look at issues that really aren't to do with uh, economic pressures and resource limitations, but which are about the lack of political will.
Um, I'd like to add to previous speakers' praise for Louis Michel's draft report, which is an excellent basis for a robust report from the Parliament uh, on advancing fundamental rights. Um, there's no question that the, that the EU's fundamental values are under threat in a, quite a number of countries within the European Union now. And this is not a problem that divides older and newer member states. It's not something that divides east from west or north from south. Um, in the country that I know best, for example, the United Kingdom, there are worryingly close relations between media and politicians. In a country not very far from here, in France, there are evictions and deportations of Roma, despite uh, reports, criticism also from EU institutions um, is still continuing. While, um, in fact, despite a change of government, while uh, there are restrictions on digital independence in a number of countries, in Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia and Hungary, and unfortunately, we see rising racism and xenophobia, <clears throat> excuse me, um, evident in nearly all member states. Without doubt, uh, the EU needs new mechanisms to monitor and also to enforce implementation um, of its many provisions on fundamental rights. And I welcome the request by the Council to the Commission to explore uh, plans for such a mechanism, as well as the concrete suggestions put forward by the Parliament. It's also important to recognize that there's a great deal in place, and that needs to be enforced. Um, we need to use existing laws and mechanisms, not just propose new ones. And the Commission has an especially important role in this respect as the guardian of the treaties, uh, particularly on fundamental rights. For example, deportations, evictions and segregation in education that specifically target Roma are definitely in breach of EU directives on free movement and on racial equality. This is well-established law. And yet we've seen no infringement proceedings against France, Italy, the Czech Republic or Hungary where there is evidence of all of these practices. Uh, a recent report that the Open Society uh, European Policy Institute produced shows that governments have correctly transposed the race equality directive on paper. But of course, laws cannot live only on paper. And in practice, well, there are all kinds of problems. Equality bodies are not properly resourced, a point that Morton Kerum uh, of the Fundamental Rights Agency pointed out earlier on today. Um, it's also evident from a number of surveys that victims don't know their rights and that access to the courts is too restrictive for citizens to use the, in, the legislation for its intended purpose. The rule of law is about ensuring that legislation is properly applied and accessible to citizens. And in the area of racial and ethnic equality, there are major shortcomings um, in many EU countries. So it's very important that what the Commission proposes um, it addresses several major risks. The first is uh, the danger of awaiting treaty reform. Uh, this is typically what we tend to say in the European Union. Well, in the next reform of the treaties, uh, we'll address this problem. There may be no future treaty reform, and if there is, it may take a very long time. And the problems that we're seeing every day that citizens are experiencing across the Union can't await that. It could take many years. And also, uh, negotiations on treaty reform tend to water down proposals and make, can sometimes make them ineffective. <clears throat> it's quite unlikely that a number of member states would consent to a mechanism that they thought they would fall foul of rather rapidly. The second risk is that a future, a future mechanism would only cover the rule of law in a narrow sense. Um, essentially, that, uh, the a definition of the rule of law that governments have to act within the limits of the law you also have to look at how a law is created. Um, you have to ensure a democratic process. And you also have to look at the content of the law. It's still possible to comply with the requirements of such a narrow definition of the rule of law while legalizing torture or press censorship, for example. <clears throat> It's really important that such a mechanism addresses the problems that originally prompted the Council to call on the Commission to act. Um, and it's especially important that member states, that countries, once they become member states, continue to satisfy human rights commitments on which their accession was originally based. The third risk that any Commission proposal needs to, to address is that such a future mechanism would only be triggered where there's a risk of serious and systematic violations. That could well defeat the purpose of a new mechanism, uh, which is, after all, to create a system that can be triggered more easily than Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty. So it needs to have a more direct effect. We, I'd like to suggest two ideas which we've set out in a recent policy paper, which is available on our website. I think there are a few copies still outside. 
Um, first of all, it's quite possible to use the existing powers that cover all of the EU's fundamental rights by setting up a network of experts to draw up annual reports on all EU member states. This could be done without the need for treaty reform or going through the normal legislative process. It's something that existed, after all, before the Fundamental Rights Agency was, uh, was set up, um, and it still could be complementary to the work of that august body. Of course, it sh such a mechanism should avoid duplicating the work of the, of the agency, or, and it should compile information from it, from the UN, from the Council of Europe. Um, what it should do is to focus upon the recommendations issued by those bodies and how to put them into effect. The EU's value added in all of this is not so much monitoring but enforcement. There, are, there is plenty of monitoring at the moment, um, but of course where the Council of Europe and the UN have less leverage is on enforcement. So that needs to be approached through both, both soft and hard measures um, at EU level. Um, in particular, we think a useful if soft enforcement me measure would be to introduce a structured dialogue to follow up on the recommendations of monitoring bodies, which could involve a dialogue between member states who are experiencing problems with the FREMP working party, with the LIBE committee, um, uh, and also with uh, non-governmental organizations. Something perhaps similar to the universal periodic review of human rights um, that we see within the UN. Secondly, a hard enforcement measure, uh, which of course is used very often in the Union, uh, but not so much in the area of fundamental rights, is infringement proceedings. It's very important to ensure that governments interpret EU legislation consistently with the Charter on Fundamental Rights. But they could also use internal market legislation to support the implementation of fundamental rights. And this is an area where there's very clear legal basis for the Commission to act and where there's clear competence at EU level. For example, uh, imagine if we had rigorous enforcement of EU procurement rules to prevent governments from developing cosy relations which, with friendly businesses which can threaten uh, uh, democracy by um, excluding those who, who could also be involved in that process. Likewise, uh, enforcement of rules on state aid to prevent governments supporting friendly voices in the media through discriminatory advertising policies um, is an area where there's, there's clearly a basis. The Commission could catalogue these funda fundamental rights abuses, but also could look at rules that promote fundamental rights and prioritise infringement proceedings when such rights are violated. I'll just finish by saying how much uh, I appreciate the proposal put forward by Nicholas Beger of Amnesty International for an overarching strategy to promote fundamental rights to match the strategy on external relations. As a number of... Uh, Speakers this afternoon and also MEPs, uh, King of Gerns and Ulrika Lunacek have pointed out, the EU's credibility in its external promotion of fundamental rights in the world rests very much on how rigorously such rights are respected and enforced within its own borders. In particular, we are concerned that uh, the argument that is often used in the Union that uh, certain, rights, uh, certain groups should not have their rights uh, promoted uh, because that might uh, threaten the universality of human rights is not really a very good argument. We already have an EU agenda on the rights of the child. We have an EU disability strategy. There are also other groups, such as the Roma, which face particular problems within the European Union and which deserve particular attention. Um, and we welcome uh, the extent to which now uh, there is an EU framework for national Roma integration strategies. There is now some specific attention to this group, which is, which is suffering disproportionately from the economic uh, crisis and from uh, some of the very nasty politics which has accompanied it. Um, it's important that the EU recognises it can use its various areas of competence, for example, on the internal market, structural funds, criminal justice, to promote the rights of certain groups. Um, fundamental rights cut across all policy areas, and we need to recognise that they are not only a line never to be crossed, but they are also vital to achieve the EU's raison d'etre. Um, not very many people quote Article 3 of the Treaty on European Union. We're often talking about Article 2 and Article 7, but I just remind you that Article 3 sets out very clearly the, EU, the importance of the EU promoting the well-being of its peoples. So we need to ensure that all of its peoples are included. Thank you. We thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Crabb. And uh, now we're moving on to welcome the presence here of representatives of the Fundamental Rights European Experts Group, the so-called Free Group. We welcome the presence here of Emilio Di Capitani, who served so distinguishedly this uh, Libe Committee for many years as head of unit of the Secretariat, and uh, Professor Giuseppe Cataldi,
who is the director of the Institute of the International Legal Studies, which will be taking the floor on behalf of the free group for the next 10 minutes. Professor Cataldi. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. President, also on behalf of free group. Uh, of course, um, I have to stress that uh, it seems to me that all of us uh, agree on one point, uh, that this is the time of enforcement and implementation of human rights, time of codification has passed. Uh, we have all the instruments and the instruments are there waiting to be used in the correct and complete way. I will focus my intervention on two issues, uh, in particular European asylum policy and the so-called Copenhagen mechanism. I would have liked to add some consideration on the so-called data gate, that is on the question of privacy and treatment of sensitive data, but lack of time and, of course, the everyday changing in, on this very sensitive question uh, suggested to postpone uh, this question on the future free group written text that we will produce. Uh, the weakness of the recently adopted common European asylum system, uh, notably in the case of the Dublin regulation, which has not fully implemented the principle of solidarity as required by Article 80 of Treaty on Functioning on, of European Union. Uh, this situation is mainly due to the reluctance of several member states, and this has been confirmed by the conclusions of the recent European Council summit, which took place uh, last week, and which are, in our view, very deceptive on this point. It is certainly encouraging to read in this document a reference to the necessity of solidarity and burden sharing on this matter, but no new legislative measure has been declared as opportune, nor is a revision of Dublin regulation contemplated. Last formulation of Dublin regulation is very recent. It was adopted in June, uh, last June, but it establishes as the principal criterion for the identification of the member state responsible for processing application for asylum that of the country of first entry. And the risk is, first of, first of all, to overload all uh, member state, so-called landing member states, particularly Mediterranean states, uh, which are geographically more exposed. And second point, this system is an obstacle to an efficient allocation of refugees on the basis of the work national market or the family network. The need should be to periodically determine the percentage of refugees every member state can accept on the basis principally of its economic situation with a mechanism of compensation in the case of states with a higher percentage compared to its capacity. Hence, the need for a burden sharing at European level with the creation of a European office for the analysis of asylum application uh, will be, of course, in my view, needed. Another point. In its conclusions, the European Council underlines the advantages of a return policy and on co cooperation with countries of origin and of transit of migrants as well as of asylum seekers. And this is a very sensitive point. Uh, first of all, we... Uh, believe that uh, it is necessary to keep separated the question of asylum seekers from that of economic migrants. The risk is that a system built to protect asylum seekers may collapse under the understandable pressure of people looking for accept acceptable living standards, but who are not in, a, uh, in danger. Uh, this implies a complete revision of national policies in the matter of immigration, but uh, for, for example, with the introduction of channels of legal immigration for search of job by unemployed migrants. I am aware of the difficulties, uh, but I am convinced that the time has arrived to define, definitely consider this type of change. Second observation, the majority of migrants who are at present arriving at the uh, South Mediterranean border are humanitarian migrants coming from Syria, Eritrea, Somalia, Afghanistan. So they cannot be returned to the countries from which they escaped. And may I add the problem of transit countries. Uh, does the, the, the European Council know, for example, the situation in Libya? This country, according to Amnesty International, in this country the situation of migrants is at present even worse than during the period of Mr. Gaddafi's regime. So how can we uh, make an, uh, an agreement? Uh, with this uh, 
transit, uh, a transit country like, like, like this one. So it is very difficult to follow in practical terms the indication provided by European Council. And we have to add that in the famous case Hirsi versus Italy decided by the European Court of Human Rights, the Grand Chamber affirmed in explicit terms that Libya was not a safe place for migrants on the basis of the treatment they received during detention, but also because this country has no provisions on asylum and never ratified the Geneva Convention on Refugees. Uh, I pass very quickly to uh, the so-called Copenhagen mechanism, uh, just to say that only two years ago, day by day, the European Union has been created, and then that since then we entered in a transitional phase which has not yet been fully accomplished. The lack of real will of the European Union member states to enter in the new post-Lisbon perspective is proved by the articles of the European Union treaties which after four years on the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty are still dead letter and refer to articles dealing with the fight against dis discriminations as well as the articles imposing more transparency and a good administration, not to speak of social rights. We have to consider that our common ground is represented by the European Union founding values epitomized in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So, uh, what to propose to face such a, a challenge? We need, you need, a strong expertise. And this is the reason why in 2000 this committee, the Libby Committee, established with the Conier Report uh, an independent network of experts in fundamental rights, which in the following years adopted a series of reports analyzed analyzing the implementation of the European Union Charter in the member states. The network has been abandoned after the creation of the Fundamental Rights Agency, which regrettably has been given a smaller scope of competence and which even today does not cover the most sensitive issues of police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, which is absurd to say the least. Now the issue raised in your recent reports, also the current of Mr. Michel is to build up an independent mechanism which can verify in a permanent way the respect of the Copenhagen criteria by the European Union member states. Thanks to such a permanent control, the risk of serious violation of the European Union founding values will be avoided. And with this, the so-called nuclear option of Article 7 procedure. This idea consistently promoted by the European Parliament has been recently echoed also in the Commission debates and even by some member states. How to establish such committee without multiplying the institutions and bodies? It has been um, said now by uh, Ms. Grubb, and I uh, um, agree with, with her. The straightforward uh, way could be maybe to modify the Fundamental Rights Agency regulation by transforming its governing body in a wise man committee composed by former constitutional judges, for example, at European as well as national level. Sounds it familiar to this committee, maybe, or to the European Parliament, maybe yes, because this was the initial proposal of the European Parliament, which is, was not followed after by the Commission and the Council. However, this is the, not the only case where the Parliament was maybe on the right track, but maybe too early. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cataldi. Our last speaker before the debate is Mr. Sergio Carrera, Head of the Justice and Home Affairs Programme, Centre for European Policy Studies. He's done the study on the triangular relationship between fundamental rights, democracy and um, justice in the European Union. This was commissioned by the Libe Committee, so he will introduce that. You have ten minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, very pleased to be here and participate in the debates of today, very central um, discussions. We did the study for the European Parliament addressing these questions, the relationship between rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy, and we counted with the participation of a network of academic experts uh, looking deeply at these uh, questions at the national level as well. And today I'm going to present to you the, research, the main research 
findings and recommendations, policy recommendations coming out of the research, and I will indeed try to make it very short. Um, there seems to be, out of the debates uh, today, an interinstitutional consensus that something needs to be done. There is an issue. There is a deficit as regards rule of law and fundamental rights. These issues can no longer be take, taken for granted in the European uh, Union. And we talk about the so-called Copenhagen dilemma. What is this dilemma about? What is this dilemma really about? We also see, we've seen um, throughout the presentations how important legal competence seems to be. The European Commission tells us that this falls outside the competence of the European Union, therefore we can do nothing. And our research, this study actually challenges that premise and comes back to the actual possibilities with existing competences. There are a lot of things that the Commission and the European Union could do as of, as of now in monitoring, assessing, and evaluating member states' obligations under the treaties and, in particular, Article 2. Sometimes the relevance of legal basis surprises me. Sometimes are central. You know, we can do nothing without legal basis. And some others, we've seen the European Commission doing a lot of things without an express article in the treaties. Very added value actions, interventions at the EU level, coordinating member state policies. So to me, the question of the legal competence is not perhaps so central. In this study, we basically propose to start the discussion from an understanding of rule of law as part of a wider democratic system and as part of a system placing fundamental human rights at the core. And it is only with these three criteria, rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights, when these conflate and come together, that we are actually looking at Article 2, the principles, the so-called values, the principles that the Union is founded upon. And any discussions we say in the study, any part of the debates need to take that standing point. You can have a totalitarian regime complying you know, perfectly and wonderfully with rule of law, but having really gross human rights violations, which are unacceptable in light of um, Europe's uh, standards and principles. Research findings. Very shortly, the study has been distributed, so I address uh, um, you to uh, the printed copy and the research we've done, which is indeed very comprehensive. I will keep it very short. First research finding. There is already a multi-level and multi-actor framework at the European Union, in the European Union, of instruments, of mechanisms, which look and assess member states' performance and obligations, including fundamental rights and rule of law. This framework, however, we say in the study, calls for more coherency, calls for more interinstitutional coordination, and more importantly, more effective implementation the study provides a mapping of instruments in the annex, a very comprehensive one. Basically, what you will see there is that sometimes legal bases, I come back to the idea, do not seem to be as relevant. There is the upcoming EU anti-corruption report. There is the EU justice scoreboard. There are a number of uh, reporting and processes on fundamental rights by different institutions, European institutions, looking at how member states are doing on fundamental rights. And however, when legal bases exist, the Article 7 on the Treaty in the European Union, you see that they are not used effectively as much as they could do. So if we are so keen on legal basis, we too have one already there. Article 7, let's develop it. Let's make it, uh, uh, let's give shapes to this uh, provision, not talk about only Article 7 as an atomic bomb. This is not useful. Let's develop the practical elements of this article. I come back to the question of sovereignty and competences, because this seems to be uh, fundamental in terms of understanding why, who is, or who should be responsible for assessing and monitoring member states' responsibilities and obligations under the treaties on fundamental rights and rule of law. Who should be responsible? Of course, this is one of the main controversies. Should it be the European Commission? Should what role the European Parliament should have? What about the fundamental rights agency? The study reminds and the study brings about new light, uh, comes back to the idea of Article 7. Article 7 is not limited on issues falling within the scope of EU law. It's not limited to that. It also extends beyond those areas where member states act autonomously. So 
Here also, more work could be done. The research done by our experts in the thematic contributions annexed in the study show a very interesting development, but which was also highlighted by previous speakers. When looking at examples such as France, Germany, the UK, and even Bulgaria, you see how national constitutional traditions, which is at the core of exclusive competence of member states, are already uh, fed by human rights and fundamental rights, supranational standards. The EU Charter is already a constitutive, increasingly, and a constitutive element of national constitutions, of the traditions, of the understandings of what rule of law is, of the, of the different conceptualizations of rule of law. And this is even the case outside the scope of EU law. And therefore, the study says, well, perhaps this is the basis for the European Union to have more action. If national constitutions already have and embrace the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and judges are using it, we, we also saw some examples, judges are increasingly using the Charter in national cases. The European Convention on Human Rights, the same, is part of the national constitutional traditions. Why not to have more Europe there? This includes even questions of national security, an all-encompassing justification for doing nothing. Oh, it's national security, it's public order, member states not exclusive competence, the European Union should do nothing. No, national security needs to be understood also from this perspective. The concept of national security cannot be exclusively in the hands of intelligence services. National security makes us do whatever we like. We've seen, we've discussed in the cases of mass uh, surveillance on PRISM and PRISM-like surveillance programs in the European Union. This, is, this shouldn't be acceptable. National security includes rule of law. National security needs to have fundamental rights at the core. And therefore, here, the European Union certainly can do many things. Methodologies. When thinking about the new mechanism, how are we going to do it? That's the other question. How are we going to evaluate? How are we going to assess? And the study, the Parliament study, actually looks at the different methodologies and the deficits, which uh, different ways to go about it could face. We see that in those methods which exist at the European Union level, which are basically based on let's coordinate national policies, let's keep member states tranquil, you know, not uh, encroaching national sovereignty, let's only coordinate through best practices, through standards, through indicators. Well, this may be an interesting way to move things forward, but from a methodological point of view, we have a number of weaknesses that we cannot uh, take for granted either. Um, even if they are soft in nature, they do have effects, and they can actually foster policy change. The so-called methods, methods of coordination, they are soft, but they do have an impact at the national level. So we need to be very watchful about this. And the role of the European Parliament is central there. What is the accountability of these coordination mechanisms? What should be the role of the Parliament? If a new mechanism is established, how to ensure that accountability is at the heart of the system? And most importantly, what about the court, judicial control of uh, the issues um, being addressed there? One of the elements of benchmarking and indicators is that it's very difficult for them to really take into account the different histories, traditions, and legal systems that each member state presents. It's very difficult. That is why the study says and recommends to rely on academia, academic expertise, independent academic expertise, the network of scholars that has been already mentioned could be a way forward. There needs to be an independent assessment of member states, uh, not subject to the politics that even Europe, all European institutions and even the agencies are part of. Two main recommendations, being very briefly, being very brief, the study presents a number of policy recommendations, just two to be highlighted. We say, why don't we set up a new Copenhagen mechanism, indeed? But no need to amend the treaties. There's no need to amend the treaties. The Commission can actually establish the mechanism. And fundamental to have an interinstitutional understanding of how this Article 7 is to be practiced better and less subject to politics than it's been so far, more based on objective evidence and even more control and accountability.
And why not matching it with a periodic evaluation? What's the problem? We have periodic evaluations already. Anti-corruption is a wonderful example. Let's evaluate member states. Part of their obligation. And three main components in this scoreboard. Independent academic expertise. Let's limit benchmarking. Let's limit soft methodologies. Let's base it on uh, social sciences research. Oversight of European national parliaments. Interinstitutional coherence. Let's establish the parliament has proposed that. A policy cycle on fundamental rights and rule of law. Why not? Link it with economic policy cycle and all other policy cycles that exist. Let's bring more coherency there. And economic policy. Economic policy governance, there's a lot of things being done there. We also examined that in the study. Let's link it to economic governance. The EU justice scoreboard is too limited. It does not cover fundamental rights. It does not cover fundamental rights. It, the economic governance must be uh, closely linked with fundamental rights performance by member states. If the Commission wants to propose a treaty change, why not? Um, the priority should be liberalizing its activation threshold. That's, as we all know, Article 7 is very difficult to activate. The Council still has too much power there. And this is post Lisbon Treaty, it doesn't make sense for the, the Council to have such a prominent voice in where is, uh, when there is a risk, when there is a threat. Not only even the European Parliament, I think the European Parliament, the study proposes that, the European Parliament should definitely have a stronger voice there too. But I think that uh, also the study highlights the role of the Court of Justice could be central there. If there is disagreement between the, the institutions, the European institutions, the, the role of the Court in determining even the risk of a fundamental rights violation uh, should be uh, uh, perhaps a priority if a treaty change uh, is to be uh, envisaged. So I leave it there and uh, I address you to the study which is published in, uh, um, in the Parliament's website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carrera. We thank you for the presentation. For the... Thank you so much for the summarized presentation of the most excellent report that Libe Committee asked in the first place about the triangular relationship between fundamental rights, democracy, and rule of law in the European Union, uh, addressing the issue of the so-called Copenhagen dilemma, the so-called Copenhagen mechanism. So we thank you and uh, we move on to the uh, final track, which is opening floor for discussion. I remind you again the importance of minding the timing so that we can feel free to ask all of the panelists so far, but at the same time, by the same token, uh, respecting each other's chance to the, uh, address uh, specific questions and get answers. So we'll be now opening the floor for participants. I see that there's, there's a couple of members willing to make points. There it goes. First, for Madame Morbay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let me speak Hungarian again. As a member of the panel, we have two uh, most renowned uh, non-governmental uh, organizations represented Amnesty International uh, and the Open Society Institution. Um, so I'm asking um, them in the first place, but other members of the panel as well, what is your opinion about uh, the fact that the EU has member states or states with whom uh, accession negotiations are underway, candidate countries, where people speaking Hungarian can be beaten up in the street on a regular basis as a recurring phenomenon. Uh, are you looking into such issues? Is this on your agenda? In the previous panel, I got the answer that hate crime is a hate crime, no matter who the victim is. Uh, but if that's the case, I just don't understand why such cases uh, of Hungarians being beaten up for speaking Hungarian, why these cases do not appear in reports. Uh, and also, uh, Aboriginal rights, that is, rights of indigenous uh, communities, uh, 
is a prominent part uh, and an accepted part within uh, human rights um, uh, activities. Why is it organizations do not uh, address these issues? Uh, for example, attempts uh, to, to achieve autonomy uh, and also uh, indigenous Hungarian communities living in uh, neighboring countries. What is keeping you from dealing with these issues? What, why are you not addressing them? Uh, and why do I have to raise the same uh, question, ask the same question again? That when we are talking about people de deprived of their rights, we are talking about the Roma, the, uh, we are talking about anti-Semitism, uh, anti -dis discrimination against uh, on, on a se sexual basis. We do not hear anything about uh, um, the violation of the rights to self-determination or to autonomy, which is a high priority in the in the UN Convention in, in Article 1. And I'm looking forward to receiving your answer. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Nicholas Beger, I think I've got his name correct, said that the uh, EU intervened when there were infringements of human rights in member states. Well, they didn't do that in Greece. I certainly don't look at uh, Golden Dawn through rose-tinted spectacles. If it's true that they're guilty of attacks on immigrants, they should have been prosecuted or should be prosecuted now. One of the speakers said that the attacks were well documented, but he didn't respond to my question as to whether or not there were convictions for it. Assumption of guilt is not consistent with the rule of law. Golden Dawn might or might not be as bad as they've have been depicted. I really don't know. However, the EU and the European Parliament in particular have not carried out any inquiry. When a country arrests opposition MPs uh, and then prefers uh, a Soviet-esque charge of heading a criminal organisation, bodies affecting a concern for human rights should at least carry out an official inquiry. We can't assume guilt in advance. Violence and incitement to violence must be condemned and must be followed by prosecution. I certainly don't confuse violence with dissent, as implied by one of your speakers. The way in which so-called hate crime is used goes well beyond incitement to violence and verbal attacks. The criminal law is indeed being used to repress dissent. We can see this in France with the prosecution of the presidential candidate who came third for a statement made during an election campaign. What did the EU do when Belgium banned the largest Flemish party? Absolutely nothing. What did it do when Germany was found by the Constitutional Court to have tried to ban a political party on fabricated evidence? Nothing. The EU does indeed show selective concern. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Je voudrais, je voudrais intervenir. Bon, qu'est-ce que vous voulez Je suis aussi un peu belge. OK, but I'm also a little bit Belgian. First of all, I'm European, but I'm also slightly Belgian. And I say that Belgium has never prohibited a political party. And as you said, that the largest uh, Flemish party, what, well, well, as far as I know, there are no prohibited political parties in Belgium. So don't say something that isn't correct. Flans Block is not banned. It uses its uh, powers like any other p party. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I will comments uh, then questions, but also questions. Uh, Mr. Cataldi mentioned that uh, the Parliament might have been too early coming up with this proposal of uh, the Copenhagen uh, Commission. I sometimes think that uh, the Parliament was too late to come up with this proposal uh, because we see more and more the, uh, the political consequences of the crisis and this, uh, the whole Copenhagen dilemma is uh, on the table, has been on the table for quite, uh, quite a long time. And I also agree with Mr. Mrs. Garbett and uh, the EU is losing credibility because of all of those violations of democracy, rule of law, and, and human, uh, human rights issues inside 
uh, of the EU and in the member states. So I think something uh, should be done, it's absolutely clear, and I think it is one of the proposals, it's the only proposal in this moment which is on the table, I think we should move forward with this, with this proposal. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Carrera, who uh, I really appreciate your uh, academic approach, and it is your duty to come up with this, but uh, you mentioned that Article 7 could be applied. It is clearly not applicable. In, the, in these political circumstances. And if you could follow the process uh, with Article 7 and the whole story, uh, I think this is also clear for you, because it needs such a, uh, the requirement is such a majority in the Council, but also in the Parliament, which, which is paralyzing uh, the application of uh, Article 7, because the member states are dependent on each other on other issues. So uh, from academic point of view, it is okay that it's applicable. From political of view, it is clearly not. I just, uh, just a very short question. It was published um, a, a study not very long, long ago by, by a, a London-based think tank, Demos, uh, on uh, trying to measure the, uh, the quality of democracy inside of the European Union. Because if we compare our democracies to some of the third country democracies, then we might say that our democracies are perfect, but they are far not perfect. I, I just would like to ask you whether you are familiar with this study and what do you think about this? I cannot go into the details. Uh, there are some proposals. I am not saying that it is, it is the proposal, but it is something which is on the table, how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gontz. Now, any other member willing to raise hands? Questions? Present any point? No? No further points. Then we will be turning back to our rapporteurs on the order to make some additional reaction or response to the questions that have been made. Mr. Beguer. Um, I'm going to respond to uh, the, the, the two first uh, questions raised. <clears throat> Let me reiterate again. Um, what the EU has in terms of, of hate crime provision is not sufficient um, and it needs to step up on it and it needs to be broadened to cover all grounds. This is absolutely decisive. Also what a number of EU member states have in terms of legal provisions on hate crime is woefully insufficient. So that's what we need. That should and has to cover all hate crime, including hate crime against Hungarian minorities, evidently. Um, however, I also want to see at the same time Hungary do something significantly about the hate crime uh, ongoingly committed against Roma people in your country. So, and then broadening that out in terms of accession, evidently chapter, opening 20, chapter 23 with any accession country should include all of the Copenhagen criteria in this area and then, you know, if the EU has uh, sufficient hate crime um, uh, provisions, then it would obviously apply um, with the accession country as well. Um, we do, as NGOs, company accession um, processes. For example, in the relationship to Croatia, we have a very strong focus on, 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 on war crimes and uh, justice to victims uh, of, of war crimes. That was, for example, a key one. We do look into other ones as well. Um, the uh, um, British member asking about Dawn, Golden Dawn again. Um, I want to make it very clear on behalf of Amnesty International, yes, we do have evidence um, of Golden Dawn committing crimes against migrants that are racially motivated. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about that, and we have documented those crimes. Um, so that is a basis of which we would be um, basing our calls. However, it's very important to understand that for a human rights organization, um, there is a big difference between hate speech and there always needs to be a lot of care between freedom of expression and hate speech. Hate speech is very, very narrowly defined for us, um, and, in, and freedom of expression is to be safeguarded. However, um, there is a particular responsibility that people of, of a public figure have in terms of, of human rights protection. Um, so politicians, or particularly people in official office, um, their speech could be short of hate, spe hate speech in the sense of incenting to violence. However, um, they could be contributing to a, 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 an environment of intolerance and discrimination that in the course of it and on the street can lead to, uh, to hate crimes, and we would be um, you know, in favor of that kind of speech being addressed as, in, as, as inappropriate and absolutely non-permissible. Um, I think that's it for that. 
Okay, thank you so much. Mrs. Grab. Well, in view of the time, I'll, I won't uh, repeat some of the excellent points made by Nicholas Bega, but just to add a couple of points from the perspective of the Open Society Foundations. Um, I think one of the fundamental problems with hate crime in the EU is the reporting and the recording of it. Um, in particular, uh, there is a problem with um, inconsistent recording of hate crimes by police forces across the Union. Even within single member states, different police for forces in different regions and at different levels may record hate crime in completely different ways, which makes it very difficult to have comparable data. And that's one of the reasons why the picture is so confused between different ethnic groups, between different bases, bases of discrimination, uh, both of discrimination and also of, of outright violence of, of crime. And I think this is one of the problems that the EU has. Also, in exporting um, a model of recording of hate crimes to countries that are, for example, uh, trying to gain accession to the EU, um, I think it's not only uh, candidate countries, but also uh, those which are before the stage of, of candidacy. Um, the EU would actually have a better toolbox of instruments to um, fight discrimination and also hate crime um, to help uh, enlargement countries and also third countries if it developed more consistent standards within the Union. Um, and I'd like to highlight one particular problem um, with recording of uh, issues of inequality and, and of discrimination in the Union, and that's the lack of, of standardised and reliable data across the Union. There are a number of member states which are against the collection of uh, data on, uh, based on ethnicity uh, for historical reasons which are well understood. But it is possible, as we've seen in, in other member states that are able to collect them, these, these kinds of data in a non-discriminatory way, it is possible to do it, and it's very important to do it through censuses as well as police reports. If we don't know what are the problems faced by Roma, for example, and the kinds of crimes that, uh, that are committed against them, it's very difficult to devise um, adequate measures and provide ad adequate public resources to address them. If we don't know exactly uh, how much uh, the, the problems of one group are also suffered by another group, it's easy to claim only one group is being highlighted and not another. So this is why uh, the Open Society uh, European Policy Institute has developed an equality data initiative to spread best practice between member states in collecting data adequately, as well as encouraging the recording of hate crime in a consistent manner. If we don't know really what's going, across the 28, what's going on across the 28 member states, it's very difficult for the EU to address it adequately. On the question of uh, treatment of minorities, rights of minorities, uh, Roma and so on, uh, may I invite uh, everyone to, to give a look to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights because um, these are problems that have been uh, tackled in a very uh, precise, strong way by the European Court and it is something, uh, of course, which uh, uh, is compulsory in a certain way also in the um, European Union system according to Article 6, of course, but it will be also um, uh, become uh, something more important once uh, the accession of the European Union to the uh, European Convention of Human Rights will be, uh, will be completely done. Uh, first point. Second point, uh, of course, uh, I was provocated. It was a provocation of mine. Uh, I, I, I didn't mind that European Parliament was too early. Um, it was too early according to what happened afterwards because the idea was to settle this uh, system of wise men and uh, afterwards the choice was another one uh, to create the fundamental rights uh, agency as we know it uh, today i don't want to criticize the fundamental rights agencies but maybe something more should be done and could be done. Uh, and uh, may I uh, finish also with um, stressing another point. Um, no one asked me something more about the, the asylum uh, uh, situation. Uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, sensitive point because at present um, we have this rule according to which only once on the, on the territory of, of a member state can a person seek for asylum. And this means that uh, the, limitation, the limitation on the quantity of asylum seekers uh, is made by the desert, by the sea, and by third states 
uh, hostile to refugees, which is very, very sad. Um, for what concerns the Copenhagen dilemma, uh, the um, chairman uh, recalled it um, before, of course, there is a problem, and we all uh, are aware of it. Um, we we uh, require to candidate countries to adhere to democratic principles, to the rule of law, to fundamental rights, before joining the European Union. And after, and after there is no appropriate instrument uh, which functions because of political restraints, as has been correctly uh, said. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. Professor Carrera. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, uh, concerning the question, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the politicization of Article 7 has been tremendous and to the detriment of fundamental rights protection in the European Union. The, the example of Hungary is uh, a parad paradigmatic one, but it's not the only one. Uh, I think that the strategy of, um, uh, of the European Commission at the moment is to say we need to amend the treaties to do really something significant. And what the study shows is that there are, at the moment, there are possibilities. There are you know, what we have, current treaty, current legislation, there are post things, possibilities to do. Things having, that could have very profound implications on uh, ensuring that member states comply with those principles that they've agreed upon and they are based on. And uh, the Commission issued a very interesting and welcome communication in 2003 on guidelines on Article 7. After that, there was no more debate on this, and it's very welcome that the Commission is going to come back to this. There will be a new communication developing how this article could be made uh, more effective in practice. And here, uh, Article 7 gives us the basis. You know, it's the, the basis, and uh, the study, I didn't do merit, of course, uh, with the time allocated to the contents, neither all the recommendations we put forward there. Um, on possible uh, EU action, uh, there is this idea of having a freezing enforcement mechanism. There could be a freezing enforcement mechanism that the Commission could use, closely working with the Court of Justice in Luxembourg in cases where there, are, there is a risk, a proved risk of uh, serious fundamental rights violations against a member state until determining the lawfulness of that practice of member state for this practice or law to be frozen. There are several ideas there which could be done. Also, how to determine that there is a risk? Who determines that there is a risk? How to determine that there is a breach? All these issues here, also the academic input could be central. Uh, we've seen, unfortunately, the fundamental rights agency is subject to politicization as well. Member states do not want the agency to do anything <laughs> you know, in terms of evaluation, not least on police and criminal justice. So I, we also in the study proposed to have uh, that covered, and indeed you also uh, were absolutely right. There have been very interesting ideas there. We've been working on these issues for the last 15 years, and uh, we've seen how uh, EU policy debates have developed and are very happy that we've reached this uh, moment and that we are actually discussing how to improve things. Uh, because I remember 15 years ago when we were talking about fundamental rights cannot be taken for granted. We were like, sorry, what do you mean? I mean, member states, of course, they comply with fundamental rights. So we are in a moment where there have been a lot of good ideas there, but perhaps we need to um, up profit from the political momentum and um, come with very concrete uh, step forward. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Carrera. Thank for all of the contributions. Thank for all the questions and answers. Now we come coming, come, coming, coming close to an end, to the final part of this most interesting hearing. Let's hear the concluding remarks by our rapporteur, Louis Michel, and then we will be having final words just to conclude. Thank you. Well, I will be very brief. I welcome the contributions of all our panelists and dealer speakers, MEPs, I would in particular like to thank Mr. Carrera for this study which supports my thesis, which is at the basis of my report, i.e. we can do much more than we are today. We can be more ambitious without changing the treaty or waiting for a treaty change. We can have a treaty change, but if we wait for that, we'll be doing nothing for 10 to 15 years, so we can do a lot more now. Secondly, 
I will try and integrate uh, many of your comments and suggestions into my report. Thirdly, on the Copenhagen dilemma, I will not hide the fact, that, and I'll table an amendment along these lines, that I'm in favour of setting up a committee of experts. They could be judges, I don't know, but a committee of experts which would establish a description of the human rights situation in each member state, that it would be a kind of a scoreboard, and they'd keep it up to date until we change the competencies of the Fundamental Rights Agency. If the, fundal, uh, if the Fundamental Rights Agency had this power, we wouldn't need to do that, but it hasn't, and I'm going to table an amendment along those lines. At the same time, I will try and get an exhaustive list of all the institutions and organizations which are official and which deal with this, to avoid duplication, that is, to make sure that each one knows what its role is. We don't want 36 agencies doing the same thing. So thank you very much for your contributions. Let me remind you that any amendments, any proposals are welcome, but the deadline for amendments is the 11th of November. Thank you. Nous vous remercions, Monsieur Michel, and we thank you all. We thank you for all of your contributions and thoughts. Let me just state as a conclusive remark that this hearing is uh, most justified, most justified because fundamental rights cannot be taken for granted in Europe, not anymore. They are there to stay. It's been a long way until we finally enshrined a Bill of Rights, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, in the Treaty of Lisbon. It's been a long way since the European Union finally got to be busy about fundamental rights. And as they are there to stay, we must mind the fundamental rights and take them seriously, as, as, as Ronald Dworkin would put it. Take them seriously, because, yeah, 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 they cannot be taken for granted anymore. Democracy at stake is at stake on a permanent basis everywhere, including every member state in the European Union. Fundamental rights are at stake everywhere, including every member state in the European Union, and they are at stake every minute, every single minute. So we're not, we are not here to look upon each or everyone else's shoulder, we are here to let the citizens, which we represent in this European Parliament, uh, know that, 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 that we take those, those fundamental rights real seriously. And uh, by saying that, I, I, I would like to, to add that uh, the, uh, the challenge of... Uh, of, of uh, Standing up to our proclaimed values, to the principles, to the so-called constitutional traditions, the common constitutional traditions of the member states, to stand up to the height of that kind of a challenge is most serious matter in this particular point of time in which, under the pretext of the financial and economic crisis, so many serious things have been happening. In, in, in the member states and so many uh, backslidings and step backs have been made by governments that uh, are, are being so detrimental to the credit that we must, uh, that we must uh, take for, for taking so seriously this most relevant pillar of the, of the constitutional dimension and the political ambition of the European Union as a whole. It's not always been so, but in so far as we have made that point of enshrining fundamental rights, I think we are doing our duty by, by, by taking these things uh, on a step-by-step -step basis so seriously. We have uh, delivered some, some, some thoughts ab about the so-called uh, Copenhagen dilemma, and we have also reflected upon the, uh, the, 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 the so-called Atomic bomb clause. I mean, it's so obvious that that's an overstatement to call atomic bomb to an Article 7 whose drafting makes it almost impossible to, to be put in place. 
I mean, qualified majorities, procedural techniques that makes them so 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 difficult to 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 be to be really effective upon 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 a single member state that we should be compelled to think of all of the institutional measures that can be taken on an ordinary basis to let member states know that uh, that they are part of a club which really cares about the fundamental rights of the citizens and this european parliament is finally finally fundamental rights lawmaker we have made a point about making a decision on the regulation of data protection because for the first time ever this European Parliament has delivered as a fundamental rights lawmaker, making an impact on the constitutional domestic uh, dimension of every legal system in every member state at the same time. It's, it should be up to the Council to be at the same height that this European Parliament has proved. But the point being that uh, whenever we take fundamental rights Seriously, we are taking seriously the re representation of the people uh, which, are being, which are being granted and, 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 and uh, uh, protected by those fundamental rights enshrined in the, in the Charter that is a fundamental uh, pillar of the, of, the, of the Treaty of Lisbon itself. We thank you so much for, for having been part of this discussion. We are expecting your contributions for the work ahead, which has been entrusted to our rapporteur, Monsieur Louis Michel. We thank you all of being here, and uh, uh, we, 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 we will keep on delivering on the subject in further occasions. Thank you all.